Welcome back to The Breakdown. This is your host Yasser Luati coming to you straight once more from the Paris South Side Bonlieu. We took a long break since the month of October due to personal reasons. I welcome the birth of my uh, daughter and this of course, you know, led me to taking the necessary time to welcome her. Now we are back with the podcast, the breakdown with various topics to be covered. Of course, I know many are waiting for episodes dealing with the French election. They are coming soon, but I also have a specific uh, program to follow. And this time I am inviting a famous guest or a very prestigious guest from the University of Oxford who wrote a book called Islam and the Arab Revolutions. We will see through this episode the role played by Islam as a religion through various institutions and uh, uh, public figures, how Islam was used to further justify the uprisings that took place in the uh, years of the Arab, uh, sp- the so-called Arab Spring, and how at the same time Islam was also used to justify not only Uh, dismissing the uh, uprisings but also to justify the counter-revolutions especially in the case of Egypt which would be a a central uh, example we will also uh, speak of various uh, positions or the the positions of various figures namely uh, Yusuf Al-Qardawi, Ahmed Tayyib, Ali Goma'a, Hamza Yusuf and then finally Abdullah bin Bayya we will see the role they played in either siding or opposing these revolutions and this will also set the stage for a conversation on the role of Islam as an institution or as a series of institutions in the Muslim world, the relationship with uh, the uh, government, and of course how that can be translated or not uh, in when it comes to uh, Western Muslims. We will of course give the final word to our guest. He will give his projections when it comes to Western Muslims, be it in the UK, the US, and uh, uh, France, to name a few examples, but also the future of uh, ne- what he calls uh, neo-traditionalism and what we can expect in the years uh, to come. Uh, Dr. Osama El Azami, welcome to you. Assalamu alaikum. So, uh, thank you for having you, having me, and it's really a pleasure to be here. I, I'm a great fan of uh, Le Breakdown, so uh, it's it's wonderful to actually be on the other side of the uh, microphone at this point. Uh, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And uh, again, uh, I'm uh, grateful you sent the book for reading. Quite a few months ago, uh, it's uh, I'm not going to say a difficult book to read, but there is a lot of information, especially you make this historic review on the Arab revolutions. And of course, as we mentioned, the role played by religion. But before we get into that, can you please introduce yourself to our audience, who you are and what you do? Uh, I'm uh, an academic based at the University of Oxford. I, uh, my parents are from Bangladesh originally, and so um, you know I've been uh, born and raised in the UK, and I came into Islamic studies. Um, you know, I did my undergraduate at Oxford, and I did my postgraduate studies in um, sort of Princeton University in the United States. And while I was doing my postgraduate studies, I, I my research is mainly on sort of Islamic political thought in the modern era. Um, although I was trained as a medievalist in my undergraduate degree. So as I was um, pursuing my PhD, the uh, Arab Spring uh, broke out. And uh, it kind of diverted me from my uh, PhD to a large extent. So my first book, uh, Islam and the Arab Revolutions, the book that we're talking about today, is actually something which I wrote unrelated to my uh, dissertation. So uh, I'll have to revisit my dissertation at some point, but usually um, sort of academics, will their first books will be based on their dissertations. So um, so yes, this has been a sort of uh, an interesting sort of uh, an interesting journey for me writing this book as someone who is actually originally from South Asia, but grew up in the UK. Um, I also spent some time in the Middle East, uh, both as a student, but also, um, you know, in, in high school, my father lived in Saudi Arabia for a long time. So in a sense, I have a um, sort of a second identity. In fact, my, my Arabic is better than my Bengali, just as an example. So um, uh, so in a sense, this is a, a very personal journey as well for me. In addition to that, in addition to that secular education, I've also been someone who has um, pursued uh, Islamic studies uh, in a seminary uh, environment. So in the UK, we refer to uh, Islamic seminaries as Darul Ulum, uh, 
which is kind of the South Asian term for this. So I am also trained as an alim, as it were. Um, in fact, uh, you know, I'm uh, also uh, now a mufti, uh, sort of in the Islamic tradition. I continue to do my studies in my late 30s, and I continue to pursue my studies in, uh, in that regard as well. And so this, uh, I, I talk about this in the introduction of the book. This is an unusual book in the sense that most academic books are written by Western scholars who are looking at the Middle East, um, very often as outsiders and sometimes with ethno-cultural heritage from the region. But in addition to that, I'm also writing about ulama while being a, a member of that sort of social class, you could say. And in ulama being a, a Muslim scholar. Muslim clerics, Muslim scholars. Um, it's it's the sort of standard term, of course. In, uh, uh, I, I my my publishers weren't too um, sort of enthusiastic about me using the term ulama in my title because it's less familiar. So it's it's very right of you to sort of highlight the uh, the, the term means Islamic um, sort of clergy or scholars. So what do you do now at Oxford? What do you teach? So right now I, I I'm a, a departmental lecturer in contemporary Islamic studies. So I teach um, contem modern Islamic thought uh, in the Middle East mainly, and I also teach um, sort of Islamic political movements in the Middle East uh, in the modern period. So um, those are the two main sort of areas of interest. Um, but I'm, you know, as my sort of uh, title suggests, contemporary Islamic studies can be very broad. Uh, my own research right now, for example, is focused on um, secularism as a category and also um, notions like democracy and um, in some respects, uh, I'm, I'm also continuing on. Uh, this is something we could talk about sort of uh, in, in connection to my book as well, because this is a book which, you know, as it says, the ulama between democracy and autocracy. I'm looking now at democracy and autocracy um, from a sort of political theory perspective, from an Islamic perspective, and uh, engaging in, a, 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 in, in research of those sorts of categories in some respects to develop a, an Islamic theory of democracy and an Islamic critique of autocracy. What, and I think this is going to come, you know, back in our conversation, you know, after we finish speaking of, you know, the Tunisian and Egyptian uprisings and, of course, the ramifications of the position of that side or the other. Uh, you called your book uh, Islam and the Arab Revolutions and the subtitle is The Ulama or Scholars Between Democracy and Autocracy. A lot has been written on, you know, the so-called Arab Spring. A lot has been said in terms of uh, the reasons why it happened and how, you know, rulers before that, that were in power for decades, Zin al-Abidin bin Ali in Tunis, Tunisia, and uh, Hosni Mubarak in Egypt, to name a few. Why this book? And the reason why I ask you why this book, and especially the title, knowing that, the first leaders of, or the grassroots organizers that led these uprisings in, in, in all countries across the Arab world did not come from the religious institutions. They came from usually non-religious organizations, secular organizations, union leaders, etc., student leaders. Yet your book is Islam and the Arab Revolutions. So to a certain extent, this is a consequence of my own sort of areas of specialization. Why this book, despite all the books that have writ been written on this topic, um, is, is relatively easy to answer. I actually um, think that Islam has an important role to play uh, in these societies and in the Arab Revolutions. And I hope my book has demonstrated that. In fact, there's so much more I could have written. Um, and it's been largely neglected in the secondary literature. Um, it's been always uh, analyzed in socio-political terms and, and the like. And I think that that, um, in a sense, leaves a considerable gap. Um, I mean, uh, the point that you make that this wasn't started up by these people, I think is perfectly valid. But it doesn't mean that Islam didn't have a significant role to play once um, the wheels were in motion, as it were. Yeah. Yes and, yes. and you know that um, neglect in the secondary literature. I also, I mean, this is this is actually a, a quite a subtle question uh, on your part because it's something which I'm trying to make a point about without being explicit. Um, you know, there is an ideological component to the fact that Islam has been left out of the discourse in the secondary literature in the public discussions, uh, and that is the pre the presumption that um, politics must be secular. And I think that, uh, you know, I've, uh, I'm writing about this and I have um, publicly talked about this uh, recently. I think that that's a highly problematic, highly Eurocentric presupposition that doesn't apply to the Islamic case and actually doesn't apply to 
you know most non eurocentric sort of cultures except that most cultures have kind of adopted the secular outlook hook line hook line and sinker and uh, i think um muslims are kind of a holdout to that europeanization of the world so to speak um and i want to highlight this dimension and i want to be unapologetic about the fact that these are ulama engaged in politics sometimes in very unpleasant ways but you know i i make reasonably clear the who who i think favorably of and who i think uh, is basically acting c- corruptly i mean you're right when you say it's a eurocentric point of view to only analyze what happened in terms of socio economic uh, socio political uh, dynamics uh, especially in the case of france and even if, you know when you follow you know western media in the uk the us canada australia uh, to name a few is that the the fact that when islam became a uh, unifying f- you know center of values if i can say for these revolutionaries then uh, criticism became being you know b- began uh, to pour on these movements uh, in france there was a t- the term the the islamist winter following the arab spring and to them the fact that these uprisings led to a demand that uh, islam is applied for uh, social uh, social justice purposes and that if we are to ex- or uh, speaking you no know, on their behalf if we are to expect less corruption more accountability more transparency islam must be at the center of the post revolution experiment and, and and i do agree with you that yes in f- at first it began f- through leaders that were not part of the islamic establishment yet the islamic establishment then positioned itself and among those people there is uh, dr yusuf al qardawi renowned uh, egyptian uh, scholar uh, who's been living in qatar for 40 50 years if not more and who has been vocal in his support uh, for the revolutions right from the beginning when he started when the uprisings began in tunis and of course when his country of origin became the the uh, the uh, the, uh, the, uh, the epicenter Epicenters. of the revolution now can you remind our or you know tell our audience who yusuf qardawi is and then we will speak of his position and why it mattered that he took a public stance on these topics so yusuf qardawi's role is actually quite um significant and it's uh, you know um as you highlighted but at the same time uh if i was giving this lecture 10 years ago um i wouldn't have to explain who he is because he had he would have had his own uh, television show on al jazeera um as he did until um sort of uh, i want to say august 2013 so qaradawi is basically um a fascinating uh, combination of a member of the muslim brotherhood and a scholar who's one of the greatest graduates of the azhar of the 20th century um you know he uh, and and both those identities are so enmeshed in each other that it's very difficult to disaggregate he wasn't a you know by the time he was uh, had relocated to Qatar he was no longer a formal member of the uh, Muslim Brotherhood structure or anything like that but um he was a you know he was someone who um as he was studying at the Azhar he had joined the Muslim Brotherhood and he had even met with the founder of the Muslim Brotherhood um which is seen as very sinister by a lot of you know uh, the popular audience perhaps but in reality of course um this is a grassroots movement that had massive following in the middle east as some of my colleagues um at oxford are currently doing research on um one of my colleagues neil ketchley is actually um working on sort of demographic data from uh, the mid 20th century that illustrates the ubiquity of the muslim brotherhood as a social movement uh, in egypt and um and so uh, it's not altogether surprising that members of the muslim brotherhood were also uh, at the azhar some of qaradawi's teachers at the azhar were uh, members of the muslim brotherhood um and at the same time he was someone who uh, you know went through the azhar um graduating top of his year in almost every single um, instance and he's someone who you know did azhar schooling uh, the azhar i should also highlight is the oldest uh, institution of islamic education um that's still running one of the oldest in the world in fact i i tell my students uh, when i teach um about the azhar at oxford that uh, the azhar is older than the university of oxford and and we take great pride at a place like oxford uh, the fact that we're established about a thousand years uh, ago let me just so interrupt you and then uh, have a shout out to our tunisian yeah. listeners but isn't al azhar bint zaytuna isn't al azhar the daughter of al zaytuna in tunis 
You better be careful. You better be careful, Couch. <laughs> of course. I mean, you have you have Zaytuna and you also have the Qarawiyin. So my my uh, sort of like a better half is uh, from Morocco and. So, you know, I cannot sort of deny that. That's why I quickly corrected myself and said one of the oldest rather than the oldest. Um, but, uh, but yeah, absolutely. I mean, like, uh, this is one of the very interesting things about um, the, the oldest institutions of learning, continuing institutions of learning in the modern era um, are Muslim institutions. But these are kind of, um, I think, erased from the narrative very often. Um, because, you know, in the broader sort of ideological narrative, unfortunately, uh, Muslims have to be a byword for backwardness and uh, and so on. So in any case, uh, the Azhar, of course, today is um, since 1961 uh, and Nasser's sort of like uh, Gamal Abdel Nasser's um, uh, reforms, so to speak, or uh, institutional changes, it's now uh, a department of the state. So it's owned by the uh, Egyptian state and the the Sheikh al Azhar, or the rector, who's the most sort of authoritative religious figure in Egypt, is a minister. Technically, is has the rank of a minister in the state. So, um, but what I'm just highlighting is Qaradawi has this dual uh, identity, um, being, in a sense, part of an oppositional movement, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, and he even spent time in jail as a consequence uh, of being a Muslim Brotherhood member in Egypt, and that's part of the reason he ended up in Qatar just to be able to escape from all the persecution. But at the same time, he is. Uh, you know, someone who went through the entire Azhar system from the high school level all the way to a PhD. And, um, you know, his work has always been recognized as being of the highest caliber. No one ever questions his scholarly uh, sort of rank. And so I, I think that that's what makes for the type of personality that allowed him, even in his 80s, in 2011, to come so forcefully in favor of the Arab revolutions. And as I document in, in the first couple of chapters, He's been talking about revolution for years, right? I mean, he, he wrote about revolution as a potential mechanism for transforming society in the 1980s, <clears throat> even if he wasn't. And, and we can talk about why scholars don't tend to be sort of revolutionary activists themselves, but he wasn't, you know, the instigator of this. He was someone who um, sort of came and supported something which had already started. His position was quite clear, as I said earlier, that he supported the revolution and he gave it full justification by using uh, scholarly work but also using the quran and the hadith to say what you are doing is actually an act of faith you are opposing tyranny you are opposing corruption and even he even compares the despots who are being challenged as the modern day pharaohs especially of course in the case of hosni mubarak in uh, uh, egypt can you please uh, summarize the rationale for Yusuf Qaradawi to justify it, keeping in mind that while you do that, we are going to you know, have in mind the fierce opposition of the official Islamic establishment in the Muslim world. Uh, even in Tunis, the imams were asked to support Ben Ali as the Habib Urgib Avenue was filled with demonstrators. And in the case of Egypt, Ali Goma and Ahmed Tayyib both vehemently opposed uh, these uh, revolutions i mean um and this is the power of qaradawi's sort of like narrative he's drawing very explicitly on the quran and the hadith and um uh, at a fundamental level i mean i can't quote all the verses and i i actually you know cite a good number of them and you know he's someone who obviously has memorized the quran and he's memorized a lot of these hadiths and he's able to sort of cite them in quick succession on his tv show on al jazeera at the time but um at the heart of it is this notion of amr bil ma'ruf and nahi anil munkar the idea of uh, a duty that muslims have to try and uphold what's right and prevent what's wrong or stop um you know bad things happening in society um, a famous hadith states that, you know, whoever sees something uh, evil in their society should change it with their hand. If they cannot, then with their tongues, meaning by speaking out against it. And if they cannot, then with their hearts, meaning they should at the very least hate it with their hearts. You know, you're seeing people being wrongfully pr imprisoned or unjustly killed and those sorts of things. And you may be powerless to do it, but you, you cannot uh, stop hating it with your heart. And the conclusion of that hadith, uh, and he quotes two versions of it, uh, you know, uh, in one the Prophet says, um, and that uh, hating with the heart is the lowest level of faith. So, and in another version it says, and that, you know, beyond that lowest level of faith, there is not even a mustard seed weight of um, faith. 
So it's like an absolute minimum is that you have to recognize this is wrong and this is something that should be fought against, but you know maybe I'm powerless to do anything against it. And, and he's also a very powerful in his drawing on Quranic verses because the Quran, as he points out, is constantly saying people should not be supportive of the Zalimin, of the people who are oppressive, tyrants, uh, and, and that sort of language is peppered throughout the language of the Quran. Um, and of course, uh, the uh, the people opposed to this sort of discourse, which is grounded in the Quran and the Hadith, um, in in the form of the official scholars, um, whether it's uh, the Sheikh Al Azhar Ahmed Al Tayyib in Egypt, or it's the uh, Mufti, um, th this character who I go into in a great uh, great deal of detail in chapters five and eight, if I recall correctly, or five and seven, sorry, Ali Gumara, uh, these people basically are saying. Uh, actually, no, you're not allowed to um, uh, sort of uh, go out and rebel against these people. And they also try and draw on the Qur'an and the Hadith. And although I haven't gone through systematically, one of the points that I make uh, in the in the text is that, you know, they they do it far less explicitly and they do, uh, in, uh, they're able to draw on fewer sort of verses and Hadiths um, that are explicitly supportive of their position, in my estimation. But in addition, I think that, um, you know, they are also kind of making general claims rather than specific claims. So they're saying things like, oh, um, Islam is against anarchy. So if you remove Mubarak, the assumption is you will have anarchy. And Qardawi is, of course, not supporting anarchy. He's saying, let's have a democratic form of government, for example. Um, or they're saying that, uh, you know, uh, you have to obey your rulers because that you know, is how uh, the Quran says that you have to uh, behave. Um, the verse that they all quote, of course, is uh, verse 459. Um, and, uh, you know, this is something which... Which uh, translates to uh, obey God, obey the Prophet, and those uh, holders of authority amongst you. Right. And, and there's also, I mean, we can also discuss the specific hadiths in a moment. So the statements of the Prophet, which are also um, invoked, such as the idea that, you know, uh, you know, um, hear and obey, meaning your rulers, even if they, uh, you know, strike your backs and they steal your wealth, right? And the the thing to remember is, uh, in these sorts of contexts, and I, I talk about this, of course, in the book, that the, the Islamic tradition has, you know, a variety of statements because this is someone's life, um, the Prophet's life is being documented over you know, a, a radical range of circumstances in which these statements need to be understood in their particular context. And, uh, you know, statements like um, the, the ones which are advocating for social justice and change need to be read alongside these and understood in a sense, um, you know, how do they relate to each other? What's happening in, in both these cases, uh, with the case of people like Guma and Tayyib and people like uh, Qardawi and so on, is that Qardawi is addressing the full range of verses and hadiths that are relating to these sorts of issues, both those who that are advocating for um, sort of revolution and uh, and those that are saying, no, you shouldn't, you should be obedient. And he has responses to each of the those uh, sort of verses and hadith that are being brought up by um, Guma'a and Tayyib and people who are basically state-sponsored scholars. Whereas those scholars that are state-sponsored never address the questions of justice in any meaningful way. They never address the objections to their citations of these verses and hadiths because those objections are quite readily sort of present as well, which we can discuss. So can that be explained, by, or could that be explained by the fact that uh, Yusuf Qaradawi has a certain level of independence, for he is not nominated by the government into where the position he's holding, and whereas in the case of um, Ahmed Al Tayyib, who was you know back then the rector of the Al Azhar University, and Ali Goma, uh, you know you know was the uh, Grand Mufti of, of Egypt, is it because? the two latter's position was highly political and therefore they were held by the uh, government's leech while the other i'm not going to say he was a loose cannon but he had a full independence in terms of what it, what can be said and not said and on top of it on a prime platform like al jazeera and his weekly show al sharia al hayya you know it's 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 complicated in the sense that um you know to what extent is uh, al jazeera a completely free platform Right. Um, it's owned by the Qatari government in a part of the world where free press is seen as an absolute taboo in most states. Now, Al Jazeera is interesting because it is 
compared to like Al Arabiya or the various state sort of owned uh, terrestrial channels, um, Al Jazeera seems like a you know um, a loose cannon, as you as you would put it. But it isn't um, completely unconstrained, and I think there are good reasons to um, sort of make that claim. Um, yet Qaradawi still has far more freedom sitting on Al Jazeera to speak his mind. Um, I'm sure that you know all of us. I, you know, this notion of free speech is something which I um, I often query um, because uh, I, I tell my students in class, look, you know, ever since Prevent came into force in the UK, which is legislation that is designed to um, track and monitor effectively Muslims um, uh, and what they say. Ever since that time, I don't feel like I've had I have free speech. You know, I feel constrained on what I can say even in my classroom right as the teaching authority so you know we all engage in certain types of self-censorship and sometimes it doesn't need to be called self-censorship it's also about what is your audience likely to understand from you um, and so to that uh, you know when I when I have a classroom where you know sometimes I'll be in a classroom where um, all of my students happen to be Muslim so I can assume a lot more knowledge about certain things than I I can with a non-Muslim student I can I don't need to define the word hadith or I don't need to explain why the Quran is important um, and so uh, so that uh, I'd say that Qaradawi has significantly more freedom than uh, um, Tayyib and Gum'a but at the same time Tayyib and Gum'a are there because they are committed to autocracy they don't need prompting on every single point. Yeah. It's kind of like the editors of the Daily Mail in the UK, which is a, a highly Islamophobic yeah. press, yeah. like or the editors of Rupert Murdoch's papers. They've been hired as editors because they already are committed to the ideology of the proprietor, and they will do the job of the pro proprietor without direction, right? And Qaradawi, I think the fact that he's given a show on Al Jazeera, despite the fact that he is actually someone who very often speaks his mind uh, on on sensitive issues and has caused diplomatic rifts <laughs> between yeah. Qatar and other people for years. Yeah. Um, despite that, it shows something about, okay, Qatari, you know, it may not be a democracy, and this is something I talk about in, in my book as well. Qatar is not a democracy, but, um, you know, at the same time, they clearly do have a greater latitude for um, articulating different opinions than, uh, you know, the other sort of uh, countries or states in the region. Uh, did or has the fact that Ali Gum'a and uh, Ahmed al Taib were both nominated by the uh, uh, government mm -hmm. or the dictatorship yeah. affect their credentials as Muslim figures? Because, of course, you are, you know, if you are being nominated by Hosni Mubarak, yeah. You answer to him. You don't answer, you know, to any other person. And some might even say you answer to him before you answer to God, because your position depends on His will right. uh, to be provocative. Right, right. That, did that affect them or or not? So, uh, I mean, kind of reiterating aspects of what I've just said. Someone like Ali Gumar, I don't think was too affected by the fact that because I, I think he he already was an absolute loyalist to the autocr autocratic uh, regime um, that he didn't necessarily need to have like he was selected because of that as far as I can tell um, and so uh, you know this is I'm just making a slight uh, academic point I suppose that you know. Um, uh, the the simple answer to your question is of course you know of course they were uh, you know heavily affected or impacted by the fact that you know of their positionality the fact that they are appointed by certain pe people but i also think that you know ali goma in particular for example shows his absolute loyalty to cc so cc hasn't appointed him per se um, when cc comes uh, you know in as the new dictator uh, Ali Goma shows absolute loyalty. What's interesting about Ahmed Al Tayyib is he has a little more independence than Ali Goma. He's a bit more of a different character. He's actually had run-ins with Sisi, but he's managed to secure his position constitutionally um, in the sort of like confusion of the 2011 to 2014 period, whereby Sisi cannot remove him as the president anymore. So the Egyptian constitution currently um, requires the appointment of the um, sort of uh, Sheikh Al Azhar to be. Um, which is a lifetime position, to be uh, by the Hayat Kibar al-Ulama. So it now technically, I mean, this is something which um, Tayyib, I don't know if he was being shrewd about the matter, but has managed to gain in the process of uh, 2011 to 2014. Um, and it wasn't removed when the uh, constitution was suspended in 2013 and, and re-established in 2014. The, the notion that actually uh, he can sort of like 
have a certain degree of independence, constitutionally speaking. So, uh, you know, CC has wanted a lot of things from Tayyib that Tayyib hasn't been readily willing to offer. Uh, certain shifts in, you know, for example, divorce laws or, you know, certain sorts of um, attitudes towards religion and so on, uh, that religion should be entirely subordinated to the state's desires and wishes and so on. Um, and uh, yeah, so so uh, Tayyib is a bit more of a complicated character now. So uh, if Yusuf Qaradawi manages to, to be the prime voice or the prime Islamic voice for these uprisings leading yeah. to revolutions and of course then supporting the dynamics that were put in place. We have Ahmed Tayyib and Ali Goma once more. They justify the complete opposite and they use what has been you know, repeated for decades or what we heard yeah. very regularly either in the Muslim world or even in Western Muslim communities that yeah. you have to obey whoever is in power using the verse you just quoted. Yeah. So having that in mind, beyond the verse itself, what was the rationale you know, followed by these two uh, characters to sell uh, the, the counter-revolutionary project right. on the one hand. And second, how did they behave when, what were their positions as the Egyptian revolution was unfolding yeah. and after it was thwarted with the al-Sisi coup? Did they change their position saying, well, now that Muhammad Morsi is in power, you have to obey him because he's in power, <laughs> or did they... <laughs> You know, right. we, you know, we right. change their our argumentation, say, no, this time is different. Right, right. No, um, it's a very, very sort of astute question. I, I should just highlight uh, as a sort of uh, footnote uh, to Yusuf Qaradawi's influence. Within Egypt, it seems that his influence was somewhat limited because he's speaking to Al Jazeera, which is the whole Arab world. Um, it seems uh, I have a colleague at Princeton um, who's now at Pennsylvania, uh, Nariman uh, Amin is her name, Nariman Amin. So she's an Egyptian um, scholar who uh, did sort of field work in Egypt itself. And, and among her informants, among her interviewees, um, she said that uh, most of them were not aware of Qaradawi's positions on these sorts of things. So it's interesting. I mean, uh, I think she has several dozen uh, interviewees, uh, and obviously that's not necessarily a representative sample. And I'd have to remind myself exactly what cross section of society she was looking at. But remember, Al Jazeera is vilified during this period in Egypt. In Egypt. And it's you know uh, claimed that you know Al Jazeera is spewing lies, etc. So uh, it, that doesn't surprise me altogether. With respect to like your question is uh, very interesting because these scholars are um, uh, you know, and I still refer to them as scholars, but sometimes I feel like saying scholars, and uh, you know, putting my hands up and saying in, in inverted commas. Um, uh, people like uh, they had slightly different approaches to these revolutions uh, as they progressed. So. Early on, uh, Tayyib and Gum'a, who are the two most prominent um, religious figures in Egypt, um, you know, in terms of the state's uh, sort of uh, sponsorship of them. Um, and Gum'a was at the time the Grand Mufti, uh, Tayyib was at the time the rector of the Azhar. They both uh, came on TV and started sort of like um, opposing the revolution. Uh, I mean, when it started off on the 25th of January, it still took a few days for them to show up on TV because a lot of these... Um, governments will tend to want to ignore what's going on until it's no longer they're no longer able to ignore it so when they could no longer ignore it at that point obviously these people are um, uh, presumably being told that look we need you now and these are states where the sort of the media is intimately tied to the um, sort of uh, the power centers and so they're very often working in coordination with these people uh, so Guma and al -Tayyib both are saying look you know your what you're doing is haram. Uh, this is the crucial term. Literally. L literally, literally. Prohibited, okay. So it's it's um, juristically prohibited, it's sinful, it's something which is not permitted by God. I mean, that's basically, it's prohibited by God. Um, and as you say, uh, quoting these sorts of verses, which we can have an actual discussion about the, those verses as well, because these are selective readings of those verses. They don't even read the entire verse, of course, because the rest of the verse kind of contradicts the absolute uh, obedience that they are calling for. And, um, uh, you know, uh, once that takes place uh, against M Mubarak, they're absolutely sort of uh, opposed to it. And to the, you know, very um, day that, uh, you know, of the actual ousting of Mubarak, you still have people like um, Ahmad al-Tayyib on Egyptian television live saying, you know, uh, you now your protests are haram, they are considered khuruj. Um, ala, uh, ala 
which means that this is an act of rebellion against legitimate authority, right? So that's another sort of concept. And using the concept of khuruj is actually quite provocative because um, it sort of, uh, sometimes they would make this explicit. They say, هذا khuruj wa ha'ula khawarij. Now this term, no, I mean, <laughs> the, the, the idea of rebelling is also attributed to um, this early sect, uh, a very violent sect that emerged in earliest Islam and basically uh, fought against the Muslim community. Um, and they are known as the Khawarij or the Kharijites, sometimes it's translated. And uh, these, uh, you know, um, people basically considered the mainstream Muslim community to be disbelievers because they were sinful in accepting the illegitimate rule of the Caliph and so on. Um, and, uh, you know, these were people who actually um, murdered and assassinated caliphs and other Muslims um, and, and believed that they were doing things which were sort of uh, religiously righteous. And uh, a number of people have compared groups like ISIS to the Khawarij. But what these people are saying, um, uh, people like Al-Gawan, Ahmad Tayyib, are saying that these people who are peacefully protesting against the tyranny of, you know, obviously they're not describing it as tyranny, of uh, Mubarak are equivalent to these sorts of people who basically um, excommunicate other Muslims and, and uh, you know, consider it legitimate to murder them. And that's extremely incendiary language. This becomes even more incendiary, of course, in 2013. So now, once he is ousted, the tone changes dramatically suddenly. So both Ahmad al-Tayyib and Ali Guma are basically... Uh, Ahmad al-Tayyib, I, I kind of discuss this at, at length, um, more so than Ali Guma, but you know, Ahmad al basically says, look, we were supporting the um, sort of revolutions from the very beginning, <laughs> right? We called the people who were sort of um, dying in these revolutions, we called them uh, martyrs. Um, and uh, I mean, technically, that's not necessarily uh, inaccurate to make that claim. But the, uh, the claim of support is, as I show, um, a misrepresentation, right? I mean, it's, it's an absurd misrepresentation in my view. Um, but now the sort of the winds had changed, so now he had changed his tone as well. Um, and this was basically uh, after February 11th, 2013, when Mubarak fell. Within a week, I think he was talking like this. And Ali Gumar also seemed to be sort of like changing his tone, saying, you know, things, uh, you know, uh, he, he, Ali Gumar never really apologized about the situation. And he um, continues to agitate in coordination with the security state. Um, and this is what we see, that when uh, Morsi is uh, running in the 2012 elections, and, and feel free to interrupt me because I've gone on for a yeah. while. When Morsi is running in the 2012 elections, and this is something, if I recall correctly, I look at in chapter 5, Ali Goma is, oh, sorry, uh, maybe chapter 4. Um, he basically, uh, chapter 5, he, he basically looks at, um, he, he starts giving sermons, so I, I document one sermon in particular where he, in a very, you know, very lightly veiled way, he basically says, look, the elections are coming up and you're not allowed to vote for uh, Morsi because Morsi is uh, not uh, sort of like, um, you know, a person of God. He's actually someone who is uh, deeply arrogant. And he actually suggests to him, uh, you know, he, he, quotes a, <laughs> he quotes a hadith, uh, which I have some explanation of, where he suggests that Morsi is destined to hell. Right? Yeah. Excuse me, uh, I'm going to eat. You said quite a lot, and this yeah. last point really deserves to be kind of no uh, ex further explained. So we, here we have a the official religious authority yeah. calling another religious figure from the opposition that he is destined to hell. Yeah. Uh, okay, this is this is quite you know something that deserves explanation because we have two figures. Both of them using or basing their rhetoric on Islam, Islamic values. Both of them using the same uh, grid to analyze the world. Yet, one calls the other people of hell, and therefore should not be, you know, uh, supported in his bid for uh, for election. Right. Uh, how how is this framed, <laughs> and how is this yeah. sold? Or, or, or how is this perceived by public opinion that we have basically two imams fighting one another? Right. One is seeking power through vote. The other one is justifying the the uh, the uh, autocracy of Mubarak and uh, you know you know calling the other one yeah. destined to hell. And How's actively, in fact, I mean, this is in June 2012. He's actively supporting Ahmed Shafi. Ahmed Shafi is uh, basically Mubarak's, I think, last prime minister. 
and he is the uh, military's uh, sort of like uh, preferred candidate. Um, and so uh, I, I would qualify, I mean, Morsi is not a scholar in the way that Ali Goma is. Ali Goma is a trained Mufti and so on. So, but Mufti, Morsi is certainly a, a public religious figure um, by virtue. I mean, partly because of the secularization of our, our public discourse and the secularization of the modern state, I don't think Morsi would necessarily himself uh, describe himself as a religious figure, quote unquote. Uh, meaning like a, an imam or something like this. But um, uh, when it comes to... So this is, this is an important point, and I think people need to uh, d uh, develop a, a nuanced sense of how, um, you know, people will look at secular politics and say, okay, well, you have the left and you have the right, and they're all secular figures. Um, you know, that sort of divide arises despite people sharing a secular outlook, right? And in the same way, despite that religious outlook, you can have such diametrically opposed um, attitudes on certain public political questions. These are questions of, you know, public interest and, and so on. Yeah, but uh, excuse me, yeah. uh, 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 doctor. The, I mean, in the case of uh, Islam-related issues, we often tend towards absolutism. There is no nuance. It's always a like clear cut. You know, you're either good or evil. You're either, you know, destined to hell or destined to paradise. Right. So we don't have this nuance that allows a contradiction without disqualifying the opposite. So that's why the the position doesn't really necess it's not comparable to let's say you have the socialist party versus you know the capitalist party or the communist one versus the you know neoliberal one. But do you see my point that I, I, I would contest that uh, and, and perhaps I mean like uh, th this might make for an interesting sort of digression but I don't know if you've come across William Kavanaugh's um, The Myth of Religious Violence um, he, he has an excellent book with Oxford University Press uh, which I, I recommend everyone to read um, published 2009 and basically this notion that um, you know we religion is categorically different from uh, you know, secular ideologies uh, is something which I'm actually writing a book about, so to speak, because in fact, in my estimation at least, what's happening in a lot of these sort of quote-unquote secular societies is these are also, um, in my estimation, secularism is a religion, and I, I, you know, have to take a lot of time to explain exactly why I mean that. I'm but a first citizen, so I can confirm, yes, it is. You know, <laughs> secularism is a new religion, if not a new absolutism, but go ahead. So certainly, I mean, like, uh, even sort of um, secular people in a place like the UK might say laicic qualifies as a religion, but I'm actually s telling those people, actually, even your sort of view, uh, even, a, 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 you know, the United States is, um, you know, uh, 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 you could say that um, that nationalism, the US sort of culture, uh, re reflects a secular religion as well. And this is something which, um, you know, uh, social scientists have talked about ci civil religion and Robert Bella wrote in 1960s about US civil religion. But I'm, I'm taking a bit further than that. But as a consequence, what I want people to recognize is actually all of these complexities are human complexities. These are things which can manifest in, you know, the notion that religious people see good and evil in black and white terms is, is a prejudice of secular culture, actually. And it's something which actually there's you know uh, considerable diversity and nuance within the uh, within these traditions if they are allowed to flourish I and mean, because they've been sort of boxed up and cooped up into one sort of small section of society these prejudices are very often uh, attributed to it but i don't think they're true um and, and this is one of the things that i take up incidentally in chapter nine where i critique you know another scholar who has basically made the same point exact same point that you've made is that how is it that you know people who have Technically, they're from the same country, they follow the same religion, they've even had the same religious training in the same institutions uh, a lot of the time. People like Qaradawi, um, you know, uh, Ahmad al-Tayyib uh, were peers. Qaradawi is a bit older than Ahmad al-Tayyib, maybe about 10 years older. But they were at the Azhar uh, around the same time. How is it that they come to such dramatically different conclusions? And my point is to say that just like, um, you know, the Enlightenment gave rise to all sorts of, I mean, if you believe the critical theorists, the Enlightenment gave rise to liberalism, but it also gave rise to Nazism, right? So, you know, uh, that's something that I think we should, you know, highlight is a propensity that is found within um, sort of uh, all traditions. And so consequently, it's not altogether surprising that this happens. But what I am trying to argue is that, and, and part of the reason, I mean, this is part of the personal motivation for me to write the book, is there's, there's clearly uh, a sort of a winner when it comes to a rational analysis of these arguments. There's a, there's a winner when it comes to thinking about how cogent is the argument of the autocrats versus the democrats. 
And uh, in my view, uh, I mean, we can talk about the complexity of democracy and autocracy itself, or particularly the complexity of democracy, because, you know, Muslims uh, living in the West live in ostensible democracies, but are, are also persecuted, in my view. We, we are persecuted minorities. Well, I'm not sure in the case of France, the word democracy applies when you don't have separation of powers, as we know it, but keep going. Right, right. I mean, uh, you know, people like Wal Halak uh, have argued that um, separation of powers is a myth in and of itself. Um, and that, uh, I mean, so, you know, a lot of these things are open to question as well. But, uh, but I, I think it's not altogether surprising um, that um, you can have people as uh, venal and as corrupt as Ali Goma'a, um, you know, making the sorts of statements that he does uh, and, and claiming, I mean, like, uh, I should qualify, he doesn't explicitly say that Morsi is going to hell, but he quotes a hadith uh, as the sort of like um, main uh, point of that uh, sort of uh, sermon that he gives in June 2012, where he says, man alayya anni la fulan. That's the um, sort of uh, he says, man alla Allah. Who can you know who is arrogating them to themselves God's prerogative of um, forgiving people, etc. And the rest of the hadith which he doesn't quote is laqad ghafartu lahu wa ahbatu amalak, meaning the person who makes that arrogant claim their works are worthless and they're destined to hell basically so i mean he, he doesn't say explicitly and and this is one thing that um you know Guma does because he is a you know he's he's a learned scholar himself even if he's a deeply corrupt man he is someone who is very careful to maintain the formal sort of like appearance of not uh, engaging in egregious impropriety so we have now this opposition between, you know, uh, Qardawi, uh, Ali Goma, and uh, Ahmed Tayyib, and the rationale behind their positions, and the, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say it, yeah. the uh, blatant hypocrisy when it comes to supporting uh, the ruler between quotation marks. So when it is Hosni Mubarak, you have to obey and um, avoid fitna, the, you know, yeah. and you know uh, anarchy, etc. But when um, the first time the Egyptians vote for their president, right. and he wins the election, it is justified to go against him and right. to uh, uh, overthrow him, even though we know how the coup was orchestrated by right. sabotaging right. the economy and right. sabotaging his power right. and the billions pouring from yeah. uh, Mohammed uh, bin Zayed's uh, uh, funds yeah. in Abu Dhabi. Yeah. And but overnight it shifts. I mean, that's that's the fascinating thing, right? Like July 3rd, overnight, suddenly all the petrol's back and people can buy it. Yeah, exactly, exactly, <laughs> yeah, right. exactly. It's obviously I mean, orchestrated. Uh, uh, it was clearly orchestrated and of course, you know, the hip democracy of the West uh, towards uh, the Muslim world is what was even more blatant that the you know, uh, oh, uh, you know the coup was uh, supported and uh, Francois Hollande who was then president had no problem right. visiting a man who had murdered his own people yeah. overthrown the uh, first legitimate uh, government right. in order to sell French manufactured weapons right, right? right, right, right. so again but that, that maybe is worth you know a, a, a special podcast uh, because there's Absolutely. a lot to say when it comes Absolutely. to France and selling weapons you know and, and the Rafale to Egypt and other uh, dictators um, absolutely we're going I to mean, continue of course it's not yeah, as Hollande ahead. of course it's also the White House I mean the fact that um, I forget the name of the uh, secretary um, defense secretary at the time Chuck Hagel he's on the phone with um, uh, Sisi throughout this period in the lead up to the um, sort of uh, massacres at Rabah and, and over the course of those massacres. He's on the phone, as far as I understand, on nearly a daily basis. And for him to basically, obviously Sisi is getting signals that, look, you can do what you like. You know, for him to effectively green light this, because nothing like this is going to happen in a place like Egypt. Well, the, the official American position was that yeah. this was beyond our control. We were right. surprised by the development right. the, or the unfolding of events. It's right. not like, right. you know, what you're saying, yes, right. we, are, we know that, but right. officially, you know what, it's beyond us. We didn't see it coming. Yeah, right. I mean, uh, you know, that that's something which uh, doesn't <laughs> doesn't even merit a response, as far as I'm concerned. Like, the, the Egypt is obviously uh, the U.S.'s most important ally in the region after Israel, um, and for the sake of Israel, and that that relationship of billions of dollars of military aid over the years is is too well to sort of even comment on. Um, yet, one of the things that I do kind of highlight um, is. And what you just mentioned, the extent to which the UAE and Saudi Arabia are also bankrolling this um, opposition and immediately sort of bringing together funds to be able to support and prop up uh, CC's Egypt. 
So other allies of the United States are all sort of on board with this. Um, and, you know, that's, that explains part of the reason why uh, Saudi Arabia, sorry, uh, the United, uh, United States was, you know, in a sense, they, they were reluctant to alienate their allies, even if it cost a few thousand lives and the end of democracy and the largest, most populous country in the Middle East. Because at the end of the day, the U.S. has never really been about sort of democracy in the region. It's always been about its own sort of like interests. You know, I'm going to give you, you know, a short anecdote on the night of, you know, when uh, Sisi was uh, overthrown. I was in a hotel in Paris okay. and uh, we are watching the news and we are seeing all these massive demonstrations. And of course, like everything looked bogus to me, but I kept quiet for some time. And uh, the person next to me, I, th I forgot where he was from, but I think he was on a business trip. And we start talking about the, the events and then he gets to ask me, you know, what do you think about that or whatever, you know, and I, I tell him exactly what's going on. Like, you know, for the first time in their history, they've been able to elect a president in right. fair and free elections. Absolutely. And and I'm like, yeah, and for the first time they get to do that. And the man doesn't even make it uh, through a first mandate. He's overthrown. Yeah. And, you know, yeah, but, you know, look at all those people who are marching. We're like, yes, but it's easy to organize the sabotage of the economy to create discontent and, and for people to say enough is enough. You want something new. And uh, and I'm like, what? Is, is, uh, so, and the, the guy is quite persistent. And I'm like, yes, but... Uh, Okay, so I'm, I, I kind of see where his, you know, his political stance. I'm like, okay, so here they are demonstrating against the firstly elected uh, president. So yes, but why overthrow him? Isn't that the end of democracy or the democratic experiment for Egyptians? And he's like, well, you know, in those you know regions of the world, you know, everything is relative. Of course, I mean, he, that's he's he's saying it less uh, sort of explicitly than David Brooke did the day after the coup where, you know, in the New York Times, this is the New York Times, right? This is the paper of record in, in the English-speaking world. Yeah. And he's saying, well, I mean, basically, Egyptians aren't ready for democracy, right? So, yeah. Yeah, it's something, you know, you know what? <laughs> Jacques Chirac himself, when he went to yeah. Tunisia in 2003, and people, you know, were expecting him to speak out because, you know, things got worse in Tunisia with right. Ben Ali when he married uh, Leila uh, Trabelsi and he's like, you know, Marie <laughs> Marie to the Tunisian Marie, Marie Antoinette. She was literally like, you know, you know, buying yeah. land and stealing yeah, people's yeah, homes, yeah. etc. And the repression was even more yeah. brutal. Yeah. It was already brutal in the early 90s, by the early 2000s, it was yeah. unbearable. And as Jacques Chirac visits uh, Tunisia, people expect him to kind of say a word of, you know, about the political prisoners, etc. And literally what Jacques Chirac says is, uh, when you have enough to eat, you should be happy about it. The first right is to be able to eat. <laughs> and <laughs> that was such an insult yeah, yeah. that, you know, he would come up and say to yeah, tell yeah, people yeah. the many political yeah. rights, you are not worthy of having but them. Just be happy that you have enough food to is, eat. I mean, you know, people sometimes... And, and I'd like to do more research on this, but people sometimes say, well, I mean, what happened to uh, liberty? Like, what, what happened to the value of liberalism, uh, the, the core value of liberalism, giving people liberty? And one of the things that I like to point out is that, um, you know, from, from its very beginning, liberalism was an imperial ideology. Um, so you have, uh, you know, founding figures of liberalism like um, John Stuart Mill, um, saying in his On Liberty, which is his essay on the importance of liberty, obviously, uh, that, well, um, you know, liberty isn't suitable for civilizations in their infancy, right, in their knowledge, as he uses the term. And so it is appropriate for Britain to be ruling over India. I mean... Something with, you know, Jules Ferry, you know, a French figure who said that yeah. there is an obligation for the superior races yeah. to civilize course, the inferior races. And that's sp that's a speech yeah. held in the halls of the French right, parliament. Right, and it's right, not right. something he said, you know, in a yeah, coffee yeah, yeah. or in a... That's an official right, discourse. Right. I mean, um, and Thomas Babington Macaulay, if I recall correctly, in his famous minute on education says there's not, you know... Um, the ent the entire libraries of the east are not worth a single shelf on a sort of british um sorry on a, in in a british sort of uh, in western literature or something like this and and this is again you know this is his speech in parliament uh, in the 19th century so you know these sorts of uh, sentiments are of course uh, 
they continue to this day. They're just not done in quite the garish manner. Occasionally they are, to be honest. I mean, people like Donald Trump are basically just saying the quiet parts out loud. But, um, you know, people like uh, Obama actually think in this way as well. Um, there's, you know, there's uh, explicit evidence to that effect when they say things like, you know, uh, you know, these people, they need to sort themselves out as though they are the source of <laughs> the, the issues that have arisen. And it's not been America putting its scale on, uh, finger on the scale or indeed going in and kind of intervening and destroying entire countries and killing, uh, sort of um, potentially causing the death of millions of people. Um, so, yeah, I mean, like, uh, I, one, of the, one of the reasons I, I sort of have become quite interested in decolonial theory uh, after I wrote this book, actually, um, a bit more seriously about it, because it doesn't really show up in this book, is that, you know, decolonial theory very often uh, spends a lot of its time highlighting, I mean, postcolonialism does this as well, but decolonial theory points out that, you know, why do we talk as though colonialism has ended? I mean, colonialism continues, uh, you know, in... I think uh, as robust a fashion as it did in the pre-modern times. Uh, sorry, in, in in sort of like um, what we refer to as the pre-independence era, and um, you know that there is so much evidence for that, and the way in which you know wealth is being sucked out of uh, you know Africa and various parts of the third world. So it, you know it, it's something that we really need to uh, reflect on within the um, sort of. Uh, when, when we're discussing these sorts of uh, affairs, we need to think about how it fits into a colonial matrix as well that continues. Because the Egyptian coup would not have been possible without, um, you know, Western support in the way that we've been discussing so far at the state level. But also another factor, and the sort of conversation you've had with this gentleman who was just basically saying, well, I mean, like, wasn't it necessary to do this, is the sort of conversations I've had with, you know, even academic colleagues. So if it's happening in academic circles, you can imagine at the layperson's level, this would be the most obvious thing. Obviously, these people aren't ready for democracy or something like this. And it certainly is the attitude of so much of the press. So the press is basically like, this is what I recall from the period that Morsi was in office, scare stories about the Muslim Brotherhood taking over Egypt in the Western press on a daily basis. CC comes into power and you barely hear a story once every few months about, you know, CC's repression, which is actual repression, like David Kirkpatrick and his excellent book Into the Hands of the Soldiers, which I, I recommend everyone reads, because it's one of the most clear sighted analyses of the Arab Revolutionary Period published in 2018. And he was actually in Rabah Square on the day of the massacre. He basically says, look, um, I remember I lived in Egypt. He was the head of the um, New, uh, New York Times bureau chief uh, in Cairo at the time. I lived in Egypt at the time and the press was freer than any time I've ever seen it in uh, you know, Egypt's history. And certainly before the revolution and after the revolution, the, the year of Morsi's thing, the, the press was at Morsi all the time, unrelentingly. But, um, you know, there's this myth that Morsi was somehow um, an autocrat and you know, I have well-meaning um, sort of like um, conversations with uh, Western observers regularly where they're saying, well, you know, wasn't wasn't Morsi being an autocrat? Wasn't it necessary to get rid of him? And it's that kind of mythos that perpetuates this kind of um, aut autocracy in the region. It's a kind of benign thought that, oh, we're just doing the best that we can. Whereas we're actually, and the West is instrumental in this, um, you know, creating the conditions actively for authoritarianism in the region. You spoke uh, of the Rabah massacre. This is an extremely important uh, point that will further uh, position, you know, the, these uh, uh, scholars. So in uh, 14th, of, 14th of August 2013, hundreds of, you know, uh, uh, demonstrators assembled in the Rabah Square and uh, after an ultimatum, the uh, the military is sent, snipers are positioned on, on top of, you know, buildings and they literally are asked to shoot and uh, Ali Gumra tells them, well, you know, it is illegal to do so. Can you, what, what was the impact of seeing a religious scholar justify the shoot to kill policy against literally unarmed civilians who are only you know, demonstrating, you know, the brutality of the regime. It's not like they were, like, you know, shaking the regime. It was maybe sending a message. And the counter message was about, we are going to murder you all. And at the end of the day, uh, of course, the, the estimates vary, but we're talking between 1,000 to 3,000 people who were butchered yeah. on that square. I mean, so this is, 
uh, you know, as I, I don't think I make this necessarily explicit in the book, but it was Rabah that really sort of um, made me feel that, look, I need to sort of spend more time on this issue. Um, I, uh, I was writing a, a dissertation on contemporary Islamic political thought going back to, you know, 50 years, so to speak. And, you know, I, I just didn't know what to make of the fact that a religious figure, a person who claims to be a, a member of the tradition in which I'm trained as well, um, is someone who is basically providing the rationale and the justification for mass murder in the streets of Egypt of innocent people, essentially. And even if they had committed some crime or something like this, like murdering them, you know, gunning them down in the streets of Egypt, including children, women and children were in that um, sort of square as well. And um, and so, you know, that's one of the motivations for me to write the book. For people who are interested in, and would like to read the book, I mean, the paperback is coming out in September, and I hope uh, within the next few months we'll also have a PDF version, uh, which is accessible through um, Oxford Scholarship Online. For those of uh, people who are linked to university networks, you'll be able to hopefully download that. But, um, you know, I actually have uh, two appendices, Appendix 2 and Appendix 3, which are translations of Ali Goma's speech before the Rabah massacre by about two or th uh, three or four weeks maybe and his speech four days after the Rabah massacre which is in my uh, telling um, and I, I think you know I, I named the chapter celebrating the Rabah massacre because that's what I feel he is doing uh, in in that post Rabah speech four days after the massacre and he also gives interviews where he basically says it's an obligation for the Egyptian army to behave in this manner right this is after Rabah as well so he's like um, absolutely um, uh, doubling down on on that position and to a certain extent um, you know these speeches that I've translated in the appendices um, you know they are uh, not public they're made specifically to the military but they start leaking and that's when uh, he starts coming out in public and sort of doubling down on his position so he basically says that look um, you know these people are um, he, he creates uh, these uh, absurd narratives of you know, uh, these people are heavily armed and they were shooting at the Egyptian military and the Egyptian military uh, was patiently waiting uh, for the command to respond and retaliate, but they lost uh, so many people while they were being shot at, etc. Um, and so you know, the reason that's absurd is, of course, the Egyptian uh, sort of uh, uh, home uh, ministry, uh, the sort of interior ministry in Egypt, which led the uh, entire sort of massacre in Rabah and, you know, the other massacres that took place on that day in other parts uh, of Cairo um, and Egypt. Uh, they themselves said we found around 15 weapons, um, which were largely kind of homemade, improvised sort of like uh, uh, weapons um, in, in Rabah Square, in a square which um, they estimated had 20,000 or so, I think, people. And, uh, you know, uh, to to describe that as heavily armed is, of course, um, beyond an absurdity. There was a huge amount of hysteria about um, Rabah, and there was a lot of media sort of um, portraying the uh, square as this terrifying place full of terrorists and things like this, and infiltrated by Syrians and Palestinians. So there was a lot of anti-Syrian, anti-Palestinian racism going on in Egypt at the time. So this mass hysteria meant that, you know, the Egyptian populace was basically you know, fed this narrative which made them support this crackdown against Rabah. You know, this is how you, you vilify a people through public narratives. Uh, yeah, yeah. Professor, uh, what does it say about institutions when one man can put forward this narrative first in private, then in public, without provoking a, um, yeah. an earthquake within that yeah. institution? Because if he spoke as the Mufti or, or rather spoke yeah. as the Grand Rector yeah. of an Azhar, what were people underneath them or under their authority saying in terms of, we are talking about snipers positioned on rooftops, shooting unarmed civilians, their yeah. own yeah. brothers and sisters, their own you know, uh, fellow countrymen, their own neighbors, and sometimes even people of their own you know, families. You know, I mean, like, it's one thing for a man to stand for for his political ambition, etc., it's cynical, but you know this is part of life. But there was no, no counter narrative yeah. leaking, at least, yeah. unofficially saying we distance ourselves with this uh, from this man. You're right. I mean, um, 
the thi so something to remember is that you know this is an authoritarian state. Your opposition to this could result in problems for you. Now, I'm not sure why, um, and in my sort of like um, scouring of the public records here, no one has uh, in Egypt, like people like Ahmed al-Tayyib or even Hassan al-Shafi'i who you know, s severely c condemns the massacre in Rabat and, and the massacres that preceded it, of course, um, doesn't go after Ali um and critique him uh, by name or anything like this. And I think um, the only person who really condemns Ali Goma, or the people who condemn Ali Goma by name, are uh, outside of Egypt for the last. Uh, you know, uh, even people like Muhammad Aymara, who I deal with in chapter eight, who is one of these people who's criticizing. He basically doesn't name Ali Goma, but he says that there are people who basically there are sort of like quote unquote ulama who act as you know um, spokespersons for the um, military state. And these people should be recognized for what they are. But he doesn't name him. And I think that, you know, within Egypt, you can understand there's great risk to, to a person to be able to say those sorts of things. Yes, I mean, yes. there's a very rare example of um, Sheikh uh, Rajab Zaki, who's this Egyptian khatib uh, who's now relocated to London. He lives in London now and is the imam of a mosque in London. But he's a blind sheikh, a student of, um, uh, forgive me, Sheikh Kishk, um, Abdurrahman Kishk, uh, I forget his first name, but this famous blind orator um, who was a thorn in the side of the Egyptian yeah. um, state, the repressive Egyptian state apparatus, and he would end up in prison sometimes because of his powerful speeches condemning um, sort of uh, Egypt's repression. Um, I mean, Abdul Abd Hamid Kishk was known for his, you know, yeah. long speeches and he, the way yeah. his voice, he's very, you know, very like his voice, his he's like, unto he, himself. Very, <laughs> yeah. exactly, exactly, yeah, exactly. Basically, like you know, like an, an um, uncle form, <laughs> like like yeah. lyrical, like you know, uh, oh, why yeah. are you He's literary, so, like he had yeah. literary brilliance as well, of course. But one of his students is basically one of the scholars who is at Rabah, um, who attends Rabah occasionally. He's blind, so he doesn't go regularly or anything. And then after the massacre, he gives a speech, which I deal with at length in chapter eight. And even he doesn't condemn Ali Goma because it's not known at the point that he's giving the khutbah that Ali Goma is the culprit of all of this. This leaks, um, you know, weeks later in October. Um, and, you know, already by the time uh, of the Rabah massacre, um, a, a few days later, you have snippets coming out that Ali Goma is saying that you can actually, um, you know, uh, shoot to kill. He doesn't use the term shoot to kill. That doesn't come out until October. So I think it's, you know, um, people are, <coughs> Sorry, people do recognize that what he's done is really unconscionable. Um, and so I think in certain circles, people are distancing themselves from him. What's interesting to me is that, um, you know, his uh, someone called Herni Bowa is the person who publishes uh, the full version of the video uh, that uh, he's celebrating the Rabba massacre. And he does this uh, in October. Um, if I recall correctly, and and he's basically saying that uh, the the sort of description of the video says something along the lines of and Hani Bawa is someone who is who used to work for Ali Goma in the Ministry of um, Endowment in in the Mufti's kind of uh, Darul Fatwa I forget the exact name of um, uh, the Fatwa Center, uh, which is a government government sort of body of course and he basically is defending him to the hilt he's saying Ali Goma never you know did anything so you do have within the religious establishment people who are uh, trying to defend Ali Goma, and I know uh, one or two other scholars who did that, but most scholars are silent. And uh, what's his name, uh, Ahmed Al Tayyib? Even though he supports the coup by making a statement on the day of the constitutional um, declaration on third July, um, when that Rabah massacre happens, he issues a statement saying that you know I didn't know about this, and I uh, I'm going to atazilun nasa fi bayti or something like this. Like you know, uh, as far as I'm concerned, he's one of the facilitators of this kind of action, but he's you know, clearly uncomfortable with the actual massacring of people, even though he facilitated the coup. So, I mean, um, Ali Goma is on another level, though. Ali Goma doubles down. And I really recommend people um, to sort of like read the appendices just to, it's shocking to read. And I think, you know, I part of the reason I, I did this uh, book is also to remind people that, look, just because a scholar says something, it doesn't mean you have to l take leave of your senses, right? Because people, I, I'm, I'm speaking here, uh, you know, towards Muslims, 
that um, you know Muslims very often have a great deal of esteem for scholars, and they should, in my estimation. But when a scholar is um, you know egregiously corrupt, um, immoral, and basically uh, perpetrating murder, in my estimation, I agree with uh, Ahmed al Raisuni's assessment here. He says, you know, Al Guma Musharikun fil Qatl. He's someone who participated in the murder of these people. Yeah, but uh, this is where it becomes problematic. First, because this actually raises the question of the role of religion to validate state policies, and then raises the question of, uh, isn't this a, you know a case that should you know legitimize the complete separation of religion from Wait, state affairs in order for religion to be independent? <laughs> actually, I, I, I want to get to that actually in the end because yeah. it is really you know a, yeah. a, a major topic, but. Uh, the fact that uh, religious scholars are rendered sacred, etc., makes it difficult for people to 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 um, to practice what you just said. That okay, he's a scholar, but his opinion is only his opinion, and I'm not bound uh, uh, by it. You know, I, so, I think that that's not because uh, religious scholars' views are, uh, you know, if people hold them to be sacred, they're making a mistake, right? I mean. This is, um, uh, you know, a well-known principle. People need to educate themselves on what Islam says on these things. So, I, you know, I'm speaking theologically for a moment, but, you know, this is a well-known um, norm from, it's narrated from Malik, one of the great early jurists, I mean, who's, of course, very influential in North Africa and should be in France among the Muslims there. But Imam Malik famously says, Everyone, you can take some of what they say and you can leave some of what they say except the person in this grave and Malik was based in Medina he was uh, pointing at the grave of the Prophet Sallallahu so you know that sort of conditionality of obedience is something which is you know uh, embedded in our tradition uh, right from the very beginning yeah but you know in practice you know professor yeah. I have to yeah. disagree with you on that because in, we know that you know all of this is disseminated and well known and people uh, yeah. oftentimes refer to it but in practice, you see that the influence of uh, many clerics and you know yeah. religious leaders, you know, actually goes beyond the, the, you know the rationality of people. Like right. you know, because he said it, I'm right. going to obey. But right. before that, you know, the groundwork was said that listen, he's a religious person, he's close to God, he knows best, he's trained, you are not, he knows you don't, and therefore you should obey. And this is what, honestly, to this day, I cannot. I mean, for a sniper to sit on the top yeah. of a building and to shoot at unarmed civilians, I mean, what does it take for you to kind of, you know, yeah. like I'm going to yeah. get back to what, you know, yeah. uh, you wrote or, uh, on um, Yusuf Karadawi speaking of those who uh, simply ob obey yeah. uh, followers, uh, no, excuse me, on simply following orders. And I'm going to quote you, no uh, if you, if you don't mind. Uh, Karadawi highlighted the role of the army in perpetuating dictatorship, declaring that the Quran makes armies responsible for the repression of tyrants because they are tools in their hands. He dismissed the excuse that they were simply following orders. And you quote, who ordered you, he asked rhetorically, a created king like yourself. And then, of course, uh, you continue on this argument, but this is page 40 of your book. Yeah. Who created uh, you? A created being again, like yourself, like yeah. Exactly. Excuse me. A created king. Yeah, yeah, a created yeah. being like yourself. My, 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 excuse me. So, the problem is that in practice, I really, how do you explain that? People know that it's a human being giving his opinion, whether sincerely or yeah, because yeah. he's pursuing yeah. specific objectives, and yet people are unable to say to come to like they are able to kill by simply yeah. following orders in the name of whoever you know, says he's representing God and his prophet. I mean, uh, what I'd say here is that, um, you know, people like Ali Goma are one cog in a broader machine. And uh, the, the narrative that I describe, I want to say in chapter seven, is it? Um, but where we're, we're looking at the sort of, um, David Kirkpatrick basically talks about um, the way in which, uh, you know, the soldiers are riled up by their superior officers and they are told these people are going to, you know, uh, murder you and they killed your brothers and, uh, you know, in arms and so on. And uh, 
I think that's where the majority of this um, sort of tendency towards murder comes. It's it's an entire culture within you know the Egyptian security forces, and Ali Goma is kind of like the cherry on top, as far as I'm concerned. Um, I think he's important in assuaging the uh, concerns. I mean, he denies this story, which I quote, um, and uh, you know, but I've heard this story being uh, told by others as well that apparently someone had, you know, a sniper came to him. Uh, saying I've killed like 60 or 70 people and I'm feeling so terrible about it and apparently he kissed him on his forehead and said you know you're actually you know you're you've done something which is very virtuous etc now these sorts of um, you know I think there are some people who will be in that situation who need to be assuaged by the Aligomars of the world and there will always be those Aligomars of the world um, but I think the I don't think this is a specifically religious problem right I mean you know no, it's not. Look, look at the American military, you know, what they have done in their, you know, dozens of interventions. And, and, you know, and not even what they've done internationally, what they're doing to the African-American community domestically, um, what they've done, uh, you know, over the last four centuries, but right now the largest, you know, highest number of incarcerated people in the world are in America. Like something, something absurd, like 1% of the population. Like who, what planet on the earth incarcerates 1% of their population? Nobody, obviously. Uh, but the U.S. can do it. And, and the thing is, you know, uh, I, I lived in the U.S. For a period, I paid my taxes. Like, I wasn't up in arms every single day objecting to the, incarcerate, the carceral state. But, you know, morally speaking, maybe I should have been, like, every single day of my life. I should have thrown aside my PhD and, think, and thought, like, why is this tolerable? And why are 300 million people around me saying this is all just fine? And so, uh, you know, I think, I think that this is a little sort of left of field, perhaps a bit, um, off topic, but I, I think that this is how authority very often works. Um, you know, Noam Chomsky quotes um, uh, David Hume, who says there's something very unusual about the easiness with which, uh, you know, um, these small numbers of people are able to just dominate uh, millions of people who, if they were to sort of like just say, no, we're not going to have it, things could be changed over, you know, overnight almost. But um, there's something in human psychology which just, um, you know, limits the number of people who are objecting to the system. Um, and it's something that we, it, you know, it creates the need for, in my view, Amr bil ma'ruf and nahi anil munkar. I mean, that's why that imperative exists in, in our tradition. Just to go back to one final point which you, you highlighted is that, you know, why is it that, um, you know, people sanctify these people and say that their views are um, you know beyond reproach and I think that uh, part of what I hope to do with this sort of a book is to remind people actually no you're supposed to use your mind but that that using of one's mind as you quote Qaradawi saying you know you would have th you'd have thought that this is something which you know is natural to the Islamic way of thinking but in the post-colonial condition uh, that we live in it's actually actively sort of suppressed whether it's uh, you know on the part of you know uh, the religious cl uh, religious classes that instill this notion of sanctity and, and sacredness, or indeed it's on uh, behalf of the state, um, the sort of whether it's the carceral state, whether it's the um, post-colonial state, uh, repressive state, or indeed the Western quote unquote democratic state. Um, you know what Salman Sayyid refers to as Western plutocracies. All of these states instill a haber for the state which is, uh, you know, an awe that people have to have towards the state, which means anything that the state says, you have to obey immediately. And, you know, this is a point that I make elsewhere. Um, you know, I, I kind of make this argument briefly in a conversation I have on my book with uh, Ismail Roya, who's a, a, a chap in North America. But, you know, we do have God in the secular state as well. It's just the state, right? The, the God of the state... Uh, its um, will is law. You cannot go against it for fear of being incarcerated and even killed in certain instances, right? And people yeah. forget that actually the sacred pervades our societies. It's just when the state says it, I have to obey. That's embedded within the modern sort of like um, state system, even if in universities and in philosophy we say that, no, actually we live in free societies. Um, I, I think that that's, that's uh, one of the myths of our own age. This reminds me of this uh, you know, quote from Howard Zinn, you know, the problem is not disobedience, but obedience. And obedience actually led uh, to the most you know, uh, brutal 
uh, massacres uh, in uh, human history. One last character, actually two, uh, uh, two people I would like to cover before we move on to the topics covered by your book, are Hamza Yusuf and uh, Abdullah bin Bayya. Right. Now Hamza Yusuf does, needs no introduction, I guess, for uh, our generation and the people who are listening to us, given our, the demographics of this uh, podcast. But Hamza Yusuf is a, is a known uh, American-born uh, uh, scholar who went to study in Mauritania and uh, um, several other countries in Africa, notoriously a student of the Mauritanian scholar Abdullah bin Bayya. And Hamza Yusuf has been or was a huge influence for the Muslim millennials, if I can call them as such, in uh, the West, highly influential in the, from the uh, late 1990s until uh, the mid 2000s, and actually began losing credit or credibility. Uh, first, because of his position on the or his response. Uh, change of position on the uh, uh, the Arab revolutions and then of course his positions on the Black Lives Matter movement which actually reminds me uh, I discovered his position by having uh, a uh, um, <laughs> actually no uh, yeah. you have that but actually I you know you know I, I followed his you know his you know publications from right. for, for many years but actually I had a guest from the US and when I mentioned his name, his face changed abruptly and I did not know what had happened on, on the Black Lives Matter movement. I was like, right. did I say something wrong? And then he explained, then I checked and I was like, you know, you know, it's like in the, you know, in the Batman movie, or uh, The Dark Knight, when you have uh, Harvey Dent saying, either you die a hero or, or you live long enough, long enough to become the villain, you know. <laughs> so, just <laughs> closing the parentheses. So, let's get back to our topic and speak of uh, Hamza Yusuf. Can you please tell us what were his positions as the revolution was unfolding and why he subsequently changed position following orders from you? Sure, I mean, so let me I mean, give a little bit of a backstory on Sheikh Hamza as well. So, I, I very often refer to him as Sheikh Hamza because I was one of the people influenced by him, as you say, one of those millennials, so to speak. And, um, uh, you know, he's someone who I... Uh, started learning from, in a sense, through his uh, cassette tapes back in the day, in the 1990s. Yep. And the VHS. And the VHS I mean, I used more the tapes. <laughs> but um, uh, yeah, I mean, like, uh, uh, so he he's a he's a um, an American convert to Islam, born 1958, converts to Islam um, in the mid 70s, and then starts pursuing Islamic knowledge. He's obviously very talented. He's very charismatic. Very eloquent. Um, and you know, in his, I guess, what would what would have been his thirties, uh, late thirties, perhaps, he starts to gain prominence in um, uh, Britain, North America, and very eloquent speaker. Now, you, it's interesting that you describe him as you know becoming controversial in twenty eleven and after that. But um, I remember him sort of his response to nine eleven was somewhat controversial as well. And as I've kind of uh, traced back, I mean, I've got a lot of unpublished um, writing uh, and reflection on Hamza Yusuf's work, um, which I hope to sort of like work on in future. He's someone who um, uh, travels to the Middle East uh, uh, and spends some time there. Um, but uh, it's interesting that you mentioned that he, in a sense, becomes controversial from 2011 onwards, because uh, to a certain extent, his political stances um, from uh, around sort of 9-11 uh, started to uh, cause the raising of some eyebrows. Yes, yes, you, the, you, yeah, yeah. Him becoming, you know, advisor to George yes, Bush. Yes, uh, and, and he sort of um, yeah. gains a certain degree of prominence in the Western media. Uh, it's at that point that he's described, I mean, fascinatingly, because he's quite young then still, as um, perhaps the most influential sort of um, Muslim uh, scholar in the West or something like that. Now, um, I think that... Yeah, I, I'm someone who, uh, I'm, I'm a student of Islamic knowledge, I, I have a, 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 you know, respect for people of knowledge and so on. But as I um, have done a lot of research on this, I, I also, as I've highlighted already, recognize that scholars can make um, mistakes, in some cases profound errors and profound mistakes. And uh, part of the Islamic tradition has always been that, you know, scholars pick up other scholars on these sorts of errors and mistakes and so on. So, uh, you know, to a certain extent, um, uh, I, uh, it's in that spirit that I've written uh, large sections of this book. I, I actually happen to think that the person who is, whose behavior is, um, in some respects, uh, the worst in this book is quite obviously Ali Gumara, 
Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's very difficult to interpret his uh, sort of behavior in any charitable way whatsoever. But um, people like Hamza Yusuf, I, I think that, um, you know, it, it appears that they are sort of like uh, sincere in the stances that they take, but do not seem to understand how damaging um, those stances are for Muslims and for, uh, I mean, for societies as a whole in that region. And so uh, Hamza Yusuf, he basically is someone who, um, as I document in 2011, it's interesting, he's actually enthusiastic about the Egyptian revolution. Like, but if you look at his um, political tendencies going back to 9-11 and indeed before then, um, that's very out of character for him. He's not someone who is, like he, he seems to have um, adopted the kind of uh, state narrative uh, of the Middle East where he had been studying for a period that, you know, you just uh, stay away from politics, um, keep your head down, you focus on religion. In, in many respects, I think religious discourse in the modern period has been heavily secularized. Um, and this is quite alien to the classical tradition because the classical tradition, you know, recognizes an Islamic public sphere in which, um, you know, uh, in a sense, the rule of law system, as people like uh, Anwar Iman write about, uh, in, in he's a Canadian law professor who writes about Islam, uh, the rule of law system in the medieval era uh, in the Muslim world was a Sharia-based rule of law system. So the Sharia, he, he um, uh, expresses this quite well in his book on I think it's called um, Religious Pluralism and Islamic Law, published by Oxford University Press, possibly around 2011. Uh, and he basically says the Sharia is best understood as a rule of law system. Other scholars in the West who've done this uh, are also people like Noah Feldman in his book, The Fall and Rise of the Islamic State. And so if there's a Sharia-based rule of law system, there are presumably guidelines on how uh, the judiciary is uh, to be organized, how... Uh, you know, it, books of Islamic law deal with marriage and divorce, deal with sort of um, economic transactions, um, deal with, uh, you know, uh, contracts and all of these sorts of things, and deal with adjudication in courts in which the judges are um, presiding over a, a Sharia-based legal system. Of course, this has kind of been systematically vilified, I think, in a place like France in particular, uh, and Austria, but also more generally in the West, the Sharia is seen as this kind of medieval, quote unquote, um, legal system. I mean, of course, the Magna Carta is medieval as well, right? <laughs> like all of these kind of the the rule of law systems that have emerged in the West are all medieval, and they will, uh, you know, concepts like habeas corpus are medieval ideas. Um, but when it's uh, with respect to Muslims, then it's pernicious um, with respect. To, uh, this is kind of like yeah. the white privilege of legal discourse, you could say, or the Eurocentrism of legal discourse. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm, there's a bit of a long answer to your question about Hamza Yusuf. Basically, um, Hamza Yusuf, uh, in 2011, uh, unusually in, uh, in retrospect, comes out and says, you know, uh, the Egyptian revolution, what a great thing. Where is America? America should be supporting this actively. And then he, I think, potentially closes that entire essay with the quote from John F. Kennedy saying that uh, if, uh, you know, if you make peaceful revolution impossible, you make violent revolution inevitable, right? I mean, like, coming from Hamza yeah, Yusuf yeah. and in retrospect, that's just like the funniest thing to read. <laughs> I mean, what he says is even like he's pretty well detailed in what he writes. I mean, yeah. like, I'm going to quote him again. Um, uh, page 95, uh, if leaders uh, breach the social contract of popular consent of the government through abuses, they not only lose legitimacy, but they must relinquish their mandate to govern. There can be no doubt, if there ever was, that Hosni Mubarak has lost his legitimacy with his people, despite the apparent legality of his rule, whether it, it, uh, whether it be cloaked in constitutional or Islamic right. principles. Next, and he continues, the Egyptian people, many for the first time in their lives, tasting the inebriating wine of political freedom, quite interesting allegory, are challenging their government courageously, defying the fear factor so ruthlessly cultivated in the belly of the bestial state security apparatus. Now, how do you go from yeah, yeah. that to... Uh, literally having a change of heart, as you say, and then start uh, legitimizing, uh, you know, yep, yep. autocracy <laughs> with the concept of the, as you call, yep. and I'm quoting you again, the uh, incorruptibility right. of kings. And then you bring his writings. Firstly, kings are incorruptible. Yep. 
غير قابل للفساد انك those who do not possess great wealth he has everything he does not need anything well i'm sorry um, i'm the son of uh, north african immigrants and i know that the more money they have the more they want be the king of morocco the algerian generals bin ali of qadhafi so honestly like can you please explain and give us the background to this you know first yeah. positioning and you, you said it, it was yeah. out of character to how he you know rapidly changed position and then went on to you know condemn any uprising or khuruj al hakim as yeah, i mean very interesting question and <clears throat> i would like to interview uh, sheikh hamza and i hope he will accept my uh, request at some point in the future but um, i have sent him in the past um, some i didn't send him this uh, chapter or anything like that unfortunately um, you know sometimes with publishing timelines it's difficult but you know i've written critically of sheikh hamza's work um, for a few years now um, and occasionally I have sent him uh, the draft of a, I, I, you know, Hamza Yusuf at one point, um, you know, uh, states uh, in something which I don't think I cite in this book, uh, the fact that, you know, um, you have to uh, uh, show absolute obedience to the ruler, right? It's pretty standard among contemporary, author, you know, pro-autocracy or lama. And incidentally, I mean, one of the points that I'm trying to argue, hopefully in my future work, is that this is an invention of the modern period. Like this doesn't really exist in the medieval era among Sunni thought, uh, in Sunni thought, that uh, obedience is absolute and unconditional. It, there's, there's no way to justify that with re reference to the tradition. And the literature from the tradition never makes that argument. But, you know, it's something which um, is today being presented as Sunni orthodoxy. And I, I find this, uh, this isn't uh, a case of portraying the history it's the case of inventing a history if as it were but i, I sent him uh, hmm. you know on on that i wrote a, a 2000 word essay it's on muslim matters if anyone wants to google it uh, hamza yusuf on Rebe uh, obedience and rebellion it should be called something like that and he didn't you know he didn't really respond so he hasn't tended to respond to my queries so i can't tell you exactly what he was thinking but i can as i've done here point out that you know in the early months of 2011 He's speaking enthusiastically and in ways that we can very much relate to uh, living in democracies. He, of course, lives in a democracy in, in, in Northern California, that you can't just have tyrants running roughshod over everyone's wills. People, people's sort of like desires and wishes need to be taken in, into consideration into, uh, in, in the way that they are ruled. And this is, you know, I quote Ahmed Raisuni in the book, but he has a book called um, Ashura, and he's basically theorizing uh, certain types of democracy as well. Uh, he's got another book for Fiqh Thawra, and you know there are there's plenty of Islamic justification for a uh, an Islamic form of democratic uh, authority that takes into consideration that you can't just repress those who are, you are governing over, but all of that stuff suddenly disappears, you know, from Hamza Yusuf's um, you know discourse bain ashiyatin wa duhaha, so to speak. I mean, just within a few months, he's in uh, yeah, in, in, in sort of. Um, uh, he's giving a, a speech, uh, sorry, he, he's giving an interview. The second thing that you quoted wasn't his writings, actually. An interview he's giving to Al Arabiya show uh, Iba'at. Yeah. Interestingly, I mean, just the the uh, unpleasant historical sort of like accidents of this story is that the person who's interviewing him is Turki al Dakhil. Turki al Dakhil is now the Saudi ambassador to the UAE. Um, like, this person is basically uh, was a, an intimate advisor to MBS. He's one of the people who was, you know, discussing the Khashoggi affair <laughs> before Khashoggi was murdered. And after the murder of Khashoggi and people were criticizing MBS, he wrote a full-throated, in English, a full-throated defense of MBS and saying that if you try and confront MBS, we will make you, and he's threatening the West, we will make your life hell um, because we have gas, uh, we have oil prices and things like that. So, I mean, like, it's fascinating who he's speaking to at this point in time in 2011 but he basically says you know that um kings are incorruptible like on what planet is that the case number one <laughs> um you know i quote uh, i think i quote the hadith on the next page um well no i i mean uh there's there's a hadith i do quote it i just can't find it right off the top of my head that uh is um sort of uh yeah, uh, either um, 
if if the son of Adam, meaning a human being, uh, this is a statement attributed to the Prophet, as far as I know, it's considered authentic by Sunnis. Um, if this is the servant, uh, a son of Adam has a mountain of gold, they will desire another mountain, right? I mean, it's in the nature of human uh, human beings that they are avaricious, yes. and it's one of those tendencies that. You know, people like Sheikh Hamza, who's written books on Tazkiyat and Nafs and purifying the heart and things like that, is well aware of, is a problematic tendency in human beings. But for some reason, if you're a king, suddenly that disappears. Like it's the person, the king uh, with all that wealth, power and prestige is the most susceptible to that sort of, um, uh, you know, uh, base human desire and it needs to be kept in check. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a fascinating transformation that takes place, but why that happens is kind of your question, and I'm not entirely sure, but I suspect, and I've speculated about this briefly in the past as well, that, of course, in January and February, no one had, could have predicted that Tunisia and Egypt would fall at the rate at which they fell. I mean, like, it was, by the standards of what happened in Libya, by the standards of what happened in Yemen and Syria, it was bloodless, right? I mean, obviously, hundreds of people died in Egypt. It was quite quite a tragedy. But, like, hundreds of thousands of people have died in these other places. And so, uh, I think that by the time Libya bogs down, Syria starts to become bogged down. Um, and there's a lot less appetite in the summer of 2011 for that kind of uprising. Yemen is also kind of go going to bad places. He's kind of um, shifted to a discourse which is, um, you know, maybe this isn't a good idea. And I suspect, I'm not entirely sure, I mean, this is something which I've, I've had sort of like inklings of based on conversations that I've had elsewhere with people who've, you know, uh, met with Hamza Yusuf and know him, that uh, to a certain extent, it's basically he's following the lead of his sheikh. And his sheikh at this point hadn't articulated something very in, in great detail, but, you know, his lukewarm attitude towards the revolutions was pretty clear, um, sort of, uh, early on, so Abdullah bin Bayah, and Abdullah bin Bayah is, I think, the the more calculated figure of the two. Hamza Yusuf strikes me as someone who, who Sheikh um, Sheikh uh, Abdullah bin Bayah is a Sufi Sheikh, um, and I suspect Hamza Yusuf is his murid, um, and so that also will create a dynamic. Meaning he is, you know, the the term sometimes used is postulant or or follower in a tariqa and so on. And uh, that creates a dynamic as well. So my, I suspect that anything his sheikh says, he'll take. So the the change of heart coming from uh, Hamza Yusuf on this uh, subject comes, of course, as you know the uh, the Libyan case becomes you know, a case of you know uh, civil war hmm. and full intervention. Of course, uh, uh, a country right, right, was right. involved um, right. in this civil war was also involved in the uh, counter-revolution in Egypt right. and also great, took part to a greater extent in the uh, militarization of the revolution in uh, Syria and that country is uh, the United Arab Emirates under the leadership of Mohammed uh, bin Zayed. And, of and course, that's why he was giving the interview as well, incidentally. The one Say in, again? That's where Hamza Yusuf was giving the interview about, you know, why... Um, Kings are incorruptible. He was sitting in the UAE while giving that interview. Well, uh, you know what a surprise, and I'm, and I'm deeply shocked. Uh, let me get uh, you know, let me get some rest so I can get over it. So, uh, <laughs> coming sure. back to uh, the case of Hamza Youth, and and, and and this is go this is this will go down in history both as another case of you grow up to watch the people you admired, uh, you know, literally, you know, behave like fallen stars, you know, like you're literally. You hold, you hold some extent as you are you know, a teenager, etc. And many people today may have been or must have been uh, dismayed by his, this position. Now, what I'm trying to say here is that uh, this change of heart came as the UAE was heavily involved in sabotaging these revolutions, meaning that the uprisings did lead to the fall of the local autocracies, but then the interest of other nations was that these revolutions should not must not succeed in order not to uh, uh, um, become successful examples for our own people. I don't think the UAE, by any f stretch of the imagination, is you know a, a near something called a democracy. Right. It's you know a dictatorship yep. by Al, -Al, 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 -Al Nahyan family, yep. and this. And I'm, I'm going to ask you to intervene on that. Yep. And this goes so far. <coughs> 
that even Muslim organizations in the West which are involved in social and or political work have been blacklisted by the UAE in order to make it impossible to see the rise of an Islam that promotes social justice, that has a say in political affairs, right. just as you may have, you know, Marxists, you know, anarchists or capitalists having their say in public affairs, right. you would have an Islamic voice or Islamic voices saying, based on our principles, social justice should be about this and that, this is where the common interest should be protected. What do you think was the role of the UAE and the role and, and their influence of Abdullah bin Bayer leading to this outright, you know, change of heart for Hamza Yusuf? Right. Uh, I mean, really fascinating and wonderfully sort of nuanced and detailed question. So let me let me first take on one point which you made as a tangential comment, which is you know you you sort of witness these fallen stars. You kind of you live long enough and you. <laughs> Uh, to quote Harvey Dent. Now the thing is, um, what I'd say to that is that I think we also also need to recognize part of uh, our educating ourselves is to recognize that, uh, and I think Muslims suffer from this in particular because, uh, you know, they will sort of sanctify these individuals, whereas in their own theology, at least, you know, like in, in Islamic theology uh, that is mainstream, there is no one who is ma'asum or infallible or you know protected from falling into error aside from the prophet or in the Shi tradition aside from the prophet and the imams and they've all sort of passed anyway right or they the, the people in history no one today has that and no one has had it for a thousand years and despite that for some reason muslims sanctify these individuals right we we think that um you know oh he said it and therefore he must be right and i think that that's just a, a lack of proper education muslims should um as i i'm kind of highlighting muslims here because i think um they have for some reason taken this path in a way that in a democratic culture generally we don't assume that um our rule our leaders are you know um innocent of you know normal human tendencies to corruptibility we don't assume that, although maybe sometimes uh, you know, it doesn't necessarily help in, in certain contexts for uh, Muslim minorities like ourselves living in France or the UK or the United States. So in that sort of context, we just need to recognize, look, these people are human beings. And as long as they're human beings, they're going to screw up sometimes. It's inevitable. And that way, <laughs> you know, you, you don't sort of like receive this kind of news with, with as much disappointment. It's not debilitating disappointment. It's always a bit disappointing to see someone you admire and you have respect for go down this very dark path. Now, what's the role of the UAE and um, Abdullah bin Bayer? And this is something which, again, you know, I'm not privy to a lot of information, so I'm using public record. You know, everything that I am using in this book is basically on public record. I've not even done, you know, interviews in most cases, and perhaps that's something that can change in my future book. But basically, um, the UAE, as we well know, as you've indicated, Little Sparta, as uh, sort of um, the Joint Chiefs, I think, uh, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs in the US at the time called it, oh, uh, wow. this okay. ambitious, yeah, sorry, ambitious state that try is trying to really punch above its weight and, you know, um, project its power uh, in the region. I mean, they were in Libya, but of course Qatar was in Libya as well. I mean, this is what's interesting. Um, in 2011, like these things were all still in flux um but the uae you know has um uh, you know done a huge amount of military spending since that time it cracked down on the muslim brotherhood domestically but it's also what it's done which um you know other states have not you know had the ambition or sometimes the resources to do in quite the same way is it's tried to crack down the on the muslim brotherhood globally right uh, and what do they mean by the muslim brotherhood any sort of tendency which could, in their estimation, threaten their power or threaten their authority. So it's not really about, you know, they will very often use Islamophobic rhetoric because at the end of the day, Islamophobic rhetoric is incredibly useful to autocracies. And this is why, um, you know, not just the UAE, but I remember watching Shawqi Allam, the current Grand Mufti of Egypt, saying something like, oh, you know, don't you know 50% of Europe's Muslims are ISIS members? Like he said this in an Egyptian interview, and I'm like, you know, what, what's this guy smoking, man? 50% <laughs> of Europe's Muslims are ISIS. I mean, honestly, I mean, like, you know, you're open, I mean, like, you know, 
coming from uh, the official uh, yeah. Islamic clergy in Egypt, yeah. this, not, this is not a shock. I mean, like in 2003, a Tantawi, yeah. Yeah. Uh, then head of in Al Azhar, yeah. justified the ban of the yeah. headscarf yeah. 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 for Muslim women in France. Course, and he did that at the request of Nicolas Sarkozy. Yes, yes. Uh, I mean, the uh, the uh, head of uh, yeah. the Islamic League came yeah. to France to yeah. lecture Muslims on laïcité. <laughs> you don't even have a constitution in your country. What are you talking about? <laughs> so. Yeah. I, uh, incidentally, with those who are interested, Malika Zeghal has a great article. I mean, a book chapter on this. Um, if I recall correctly, it's on in a in a um, edited volume with Princeton University Press called uh, Schooling Islam. But uh, she talks. Uh, she does a fascinating comparison between uh, Yusuf Al Khalabawi and um, Sayyid Tantawi on how they responded to the French ban. And so Sayyid Tantawi is operating within the autocratic mindset. The state says this, therefore it is gospel. Regardless of what our religion says, you just have to obey the state. And Yusuf Al Khalabawi is saying, no, use the mechanisms that are enshrined in a democratic, free, ostensibly free society, and try and resist what the state is trying to impose on your minority. And, you know, that's the, I think, the, the difference in mindset between someone like Abdullah bin Bayya and Sheikh Yusuf Khaldawi, Hamza Yusuf and Yusuf Khaldawi. What's really tragic about this case of Hamza Yusuf is someone who, in my estimation, is kind of like, um, you know, this is a, a harsh way of putting it, but, you know, almost taken leave of his senses in order to submit completely to this kind of um, uh, authoritarian religious mindset. And... As I want to repeatedly emphasize, this authoritarian religious mindset is an invention of the modern period. Or, you know, if you are to believe people like um, Ahmed Shamsi is a great historian uh, of um, Islam, actually the whole of Islam. But his, his recent book, uh, Rediscovering the Islamic Classics, talks about the last 500 years as kind of going down a path which has lent itself to this kind of obscurantism. And I think um, the sort of the Islamic tradition uh, in the uh, sort of in its dominant guise through most of its history wasn't obscurantist it actually was about sort of having clear understanding but authoritarianism depends on obscurantism it depends on obfuscation and making people think actually these are things beyond you and you have to on trust accept my word and you know one of the things that I'm a point I make in the epilogue is that you know we need accountability in every level of society uh, you know, to, we, we can, if you want, discuss this a bit later. The idea of Allah, This verse 459, which is quoted by autoc autocracies, they always quote it up to that point. Obey God and obey his messenger and those in authority among you. What does it say next, right? But if you disagree about anything, so that's countenanced in the verse, then go back to God and his messenger. Okay. So God and his messenger are the arbiter for your disagreements with the Uli al-Amr, with the people who are sort of in power. And so, I mean, to a certain extent, it's it's smart of them to try and co-opt certain people who claim to speak in the name of God and his messenger. But the verse itself places contingencies on their claims to authority. And I think, um, I mean, that's, that's an area, inshallah, we can discuss. But just to go back to the question of what you know, precipitates this change in a person like Hamza Yusuf, and how do we understand it within the orbit of Abdullah bin Bayya and the UAE? I document this in uh, sort of uh, chapter four, if I recall correctly, where basically the UAE sees this opportunity. This is how I interpret it. They see this opportunity in Abdullah bin Bayya. Abdullah bin Bayya is someone who's the vice president to Yusuf al Qaradawi at the International Union of Muslim Scholars. This is a kind of global transnational institution which has, uh, you know, a, a, quite a bit of influence by virtue of having Yusuf al-Qarabawi at its head. It was established in 2004 and Qarabawi remains its head until 2018. But in 2011, when the um, revolutions begin, uh, Qarabawi and Bin Bayya are working together. And uh, as time passes, Bin Bayya, even in 2011, he's like clearly lukewarm about the um, sort of uh, the revolutions. Um, and uh, you know, by 2013, he's publishing books where he's, you know, basically saying the ruler has the right to do what they want. And, um, you know, that authoritarian discourse is obviously uh, sort of picked up by careful listeners in the U United Arab Emirates. And I say it's obviously picked up by them because he gives a lecture in uh, Kuwait as part of a conference on an obscure jurisprudential subject known as Tahqiq al-Manat. But embedded within that lecture is a statement that uh, 
the people who are able to make decisions about the way in which Islamic law operates in political matters are the rulers and no one has oversight over them right this is kind of the uh, the seed of authoritarianism in the ideas of Abdullah bin Bayah stated in if I recall correctly February 2013 uh, a few days later uh, Abdullah bin Zayed the foreign minister of the UAE is visiting his home in Jibda and uh, Abdullah bin Zayed tweets about this bin Bayah um, sort of highlights that tweet on his personal website and you can see this is the beginning of a, uh, you know, a great friendship, <laughs> you know, a great love story, shall we say. And so then Abdullah bin Bayah is um, sort of the, the Rabah massacre is happening, the Egyptian coup is taking place. At the end of July when these massacres are taking place, the initial massacres after Sisi calls for a mandate to confront terrorism. Uh, quote unquote. Um, what was uh, 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 Hamza Yusuf's uh, position on the Rabah massacre? So they haven't stated anything. Um, neither Bin Bayah nor Hamza Yusuf have stated anything. They've remained studiously quiet, as far as I'm aware. And, um, you know, uh, these are people who they're not exactly sort of put in front of um, hostile questioners, shall we say, or, or uh, you know, um, investigative journalists or something along those lines. So we don't actually have. Um, any opportunity to ask those questions. As I've said to you before, I have sent uh, Sheikh Hamza sort of like drafts of articles that I've written um, to get his, you know, in a sense, right of reply. Um, but he doesn't, uh, hasn't responded to me in the past. He has, you know, he's been kind enough. He sent me a message um, just after my brother passed away, um, uh, sending me condolences. So he's, he's very kind yes. and, and, you know, to do something like this, but he's not responding to these sorts of queries that I've sent in the past. And, I'll, you know, um, I, I hope to continue sending him messages as I continue writing and so on. Um, so there's there's nothing explicit. I mean, Abdullah bin Bayah in late July 2013, when these initial massacres are taking place, is in the UAE, which already has pledged to give billions to Egypt after the coup had taken place. Um, on a kind of national day celebrating the Al Nahyans uh, and their charitable work globally, and he's you know fulsome in his praise of them. Wonderful. So I mean, he, he I think he makes clear whom he thinks are the sort of the good guys in in the sort of global setting. But at the same time, you know, he's he's a jurist. Uh, he's it's important to remember he's also a politician. Yeah, Not yeah. just at this point when he becomes appointed by the UAE as their Grand Mufti or as the but head back of Back in Mauritania, yeah. yeah he was, but in yeah. Mauritania, he was the Deputy Prime Minister in the 1970s in the one-party state of, um, I forget the name, uh, Dadda, I think it was his name. But uh, yeah, I mean, he is someone who is obviously, um, you know, a capable politician if he's going to be Deputy Prime Minister of a country. Uh, I think his son is a minister at the moment in the Mauritanian government, possibly. Um, and he has another son who's a uh, an ambassador. I can't remember to which country. Um, and his uh, and he has another son whose uh, nickname is Shekhna. Um, and uh, Shekhna is uh, his one of his major liaisons with the UAE. So I've only met Shekhna because he used to travel with him regularly when uh, when he would do international trips. And um, I remember sort of like uh, you know he uh, when he travels to the UN and. There's this fascinating photo of um, uh, Sheikh Ben Bayer with uh, Mike Pence, for example, and you have a photo of um, Shekhna standing with uh, Ivana Trump. So I mean, like, um, you know, it's it's uh, <laughs> it's you know, Hamza Yusuf was an official uh, in a commission for the Trump um, administration as well on freedom of religion. So, you know, um, the UAE has, uh, I think, um, lobbied for these sorts of people to. I mean, like. Bin Bayo was quoted by the by Obama in the UN at the General Assembly in 2014, if I recall correctly, 2014, yeah, um, saying that you know he here is a person who's going to confront the um, sort of the problem of um, terrorism in in the Muslim world or something like this by calling for peace. Um, and so remember, 2014 is when you had the establishment of the Forum for Promoting Peace in Muslim Societies. What a yeah. wonderful name. It's straight out of George Orwell, right? And um, Newspeak. And so um, what you have is, this is on its website, it says the patron, the Ra'i, is um, Abdullah bin Zayed, who is the Foreign Minister of the United Arab Emirates. And so this is very obviously a project of the Foreign Ministry of the United Arab Emirates, 
uh, FPPMS, the Forum for Promoting Peace, um, wonderful name, is about projecting the UAE's vision of what religion is yes. uh, on a global scale. And we had here some effects in France when they organized, uh, because in fr France has been home for over 30 years, if not 40, right. Right. the uh, annual meeting of French Muslims, was, which was actually a European platform where you had... Bourget. Yeah. At Le Bourget, exactly. Okay, okay, okay. And you had Muslims from all over Europe, you know, you know, going to Le Bourget in the north, um, this, uh, northern sub, northern banlieue of Paris. Right. And that was like, you know, a week long event with conferences and, you know, right. meetings, etc. And the counter Le Bourget, if I can say, was organized in a, a town called Montreuil, just a few miles away from Le Bourget. Okay. And this one brought in the pro-Israelis and Muslims and the pro-Israeli lobbyists in France. Mm -hmm. And we know that the patronage was actually the UAE. Right. And they even used highly discredited figures like Hassan Shalroumi, who is like a puppet at the hands of the Zionists in France that nobody right. listens to but white people. And he was the one right. coordinating the event. So right. you are right, like the UAE is indeed projecting its influence beyond its borders and promoting its own brand of Islam. Now, can you please summarize what, the, what brand of Islam is the UAE uh, um, you know, lobbying for? Right. And then we will open the discussion for uh, the separation of religion and government given all what has been said sure. and whether to obey or not. So please summarize to us what this UAE brand of Islam means. So, I mean, I've, uh, one of the things that I've said in, in the past is that the UAE's brand of Islam is in many respects basically a secular version of ISIS. <laughs> right. So it's basically about absolute authoritarianism. Um, the rulers have an absolute say on, you know, how uh, life should be conducted in, in your um, region. And this is where uh, I have a short article, actually, for a Libyan think tank, um, the Sadiq Institute, on the concept of Islamism, because they create these sorts of labels. I use the term as an academic in this book, but they create these kinds of labels to, you know, create a boogeyman which will uh, appeal to a Western audience very often because they create a narrative between you have the Islamists and the secularists. But what it really should be is there should be a distinction between uh, Democrats and authoritarians. And once we realize that this is a fight between Democrats and authoritarians, you realize actually authoritarianism can come in different guises as well. You have the UAE's authoritarianism, you have ISIS authoritarianism, but they're actually partners. They're on the same side of that divide. And the Democrats are people like, uh, you know, the Muslim Brotherhood in the region in particular. Unfortunately, the liberals sometimes, um, or very often, end up on the side of the authoritarians, right, in, in the region in particular. And as you said, like Hollande or Macron giving the Légion d'honneur to uh, CC just after he cracked down on human rights organizations, indeed liberal human rights organizations, right? So, you know, those sorts of hypocrisies are well uh, worn to, in the traditions of colonialism that we're familiar with. So um, I, I'm sorry, I kind of went off on one. Um, with respect to uh, the UAE's sort of notion of Islam, it's basically one where, uh, to quote uh, Noam Chomsky, it's a form of Islam where what we say goes, right? It's basically um, our absolute right to do whatever we want. And as I, I mentioned, uh, Abdul bin Bayer, in a sense, underwrites this in theological and, and juristic terms. He basically says that, in matters of public interest, or public, you know, in, in matters of al umur al amma, so the public, more generally, or the public good, the ruler has an absolute right to make decisions uh, without any oversight from the ulama. So historically, the Sharia was a rule of law system, and uh, siyasa uh, it means something else in uh, sort of is Islamic historical jurisprudence. Siyasa basically was. Um, public policy decision making on the part of the executive. Um, Siasa was always seen as um, amenable to uh, judicial review, as it were, okay, from, from a Sharia perspective. So the, there was a latitude for the executive branch to engage in certain sorts of practices, but the ulama could have, I mean, sometimes I'm, I'm sure there were sort of political crises and the people who had the most power uh, would, you know, win those, but in principle, and these principles are absolutely essential for the running of any sort of political system. In principle, the um, sort of the rulers were uh, had were un under the check of a rule of law system, which was uh, 
governed under independent principles to the rulers themselves. It was a Sharia rule of law system, which was a discursive tradition, that not in control of the ruling class. What Bin Baya is doing, which is such, in my estimation, such a major innovation, and uh, you know, I, I hope to explore this further to see whether my claim that it's a major innovation really does hold. But I, I do feel that this is the case. He basically says, no, the ruler has the right without any oversight, and so he's underwriting. Uh, authoritarianism, absolutism, in a way, in my estimation, has never existed in Islamic history. Like this absolute right for the ruler to do what they want has never been justified in Sharia terms. It's sometimes been sort of like uh, seen as, okay, well, that's kind of the reality in which we live. Um, but this was in pre-modern times when the state was a minuscule affair that didn't, you know, uh, interfere in every aspect of human uh, existence, really. So the authoritarianism that these people claim to be bringing from the medieval era is not an authoritarianism to begin with. Civil society was, you know, to use the idea somewhat anachronistically, it was flourishing and independent of the machinations that were taking place in the palace. And scholars were independent on, you know, had you know, full latitude to express themselves. And scholars, I mean, um, in large part, I mean, you could have certain scholars who might be close to the um, palace, but the thing is, the discourse of the Sharia is independent. It's not. Uh, it's not something that you can control. Remember, we don't have modern technologies. We don't have surveillance states and things like that. And so there was. I mean, um, those who are interested in Islamic history will be familiar with the um, term the Mehna um, uh, of uh, Ahmed ibn Hanbal. So this was something which took place um, in the sort of ninth century, and basically the state was trying to impose its own religious doctrine on the ulama. And ultimately, the state lost. And that's very often seen as the point at which the ulama uh, cemented their claim to independence from the state. Okay, Some people claim that it's a kind of secularization of religion, but I think that's, a, you know, that's the projection of a certain understanding, a Eurocentric understanding of history onto Muslim history as well. But they, therefore, the ulama's discourses thereafter, it was never really attempted that the the state would try and take control of the ulama's discourses until the modern era, in my estimation. Now we, we've been spe speaking quite extensively on the role of various scholars, clerics, yeah. uh, some preachers, and how they can either justify, you know, a quest for justice, yeah. and the opposition to it, if not the, uh, the bloody repression of any quest for justice. Right. Now, many would make the case that because in countries, in Muslim majority countries, the religious establishment is affiliated to the power in place. The power in place is, in most of the cases, a dictatorship, an autocracy, overly co corrupt, opaque, and does not understand what it means, rule of law, transparency, etc. Right. Many would make the case that um, uh, it might be more, you know, uh, effective or efficient or it might be actually a better idea or a better choice for society that religion is separated from the state in order for religion to thrive on its own and be kind of a moral compass and then allow a space where uh, opposition to the state can be expressed using a religious uh, lexicon when needed but also to make it more difficult for the government to justify its policies however brutal they are, by using religion and, um, how can I say, uh, uh, using, you know, religious figures in order for them to, like, like, like the case of Ali Goma and others, yeah, yeah, well, yeah. you ought to obey alaykum wa ta'a. You yeah. know, you, you must listen and obey. Yeah. So, I think this is actually something of a complicated, um, sort of, we, we find ourselves in a difficult situation because you can set up that ideal, but the state will always try and co-opt religion, right? So there will always be these figures who are possible to uh, sort of buy off on the on the part of the state. And then, um, I, I mean, there are people who are arguing this is an argument for the separation of religion and state. But what I would say, uh, drawing on my own theory of what secularism is, and I'm uh, still in the process of articulating it. I mean, I, I have a brief sort of articulation of this in a short article that I've written for Gresham College. Uh, you can see, uh, you can Google uh, Usama al Azmi Secularism, Gresham College, or just Usama al Azmi Secularism, it should come up. I gave a lecture on this in November and I, I wrote a short piece on it as well. But in my view, secular states are religious. 
The only reason we refer to um, sort of these states as secular rather than religious is because of the invention of the category of religion in a Eurocentric uh, coin in uh, 20, uh, sorry, in, in the uh, seven, around the 17th century. So after the Europe's experiences with the wars of religion, religion starts to become privatized and it starts to be redefined as being outside of the public sphere. But if you take a, a decolonial non-Eurocentric conception of what religion is, and you take the concept of Dean, for example, Dean is all encompassing, right? What they've done in my estimation by uh, creating a category of religion is to thereby say the sort of like historical religions are to be kept out of the public sphere. And they create all of these narratives, in my view, myths of secularism, which are that, oh, religion is, you know, uh, all or nothing discourse, it's black and white, and you can't have, uh, you know, moderation, etc. Well, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, uh, the two world wars weren't religious wars, right? They were secular wars. And in my conception of religion, they were religious wars, in fact, because what's happening is from an Islamic perspective, a deen is a system of thought to organize uh, society and bring about social cohesion. Um, in terms of like uh, the, the value systems that we're drawing on, uh, the last 50, 60 years of Western philosophy has demonstrated the contingency of Western claims to rationality. I mean, you're from France, the land of Derrida and Foucault and all of these people who basically, you know, took apart all of these liberal claims of being uh, based on rationality and the, the very notion of uh, deconstruction. I'm not a deconstructionist myself. I, I follow sort of like, I, I find appealing the ideas of people like uh, Alistair McIntyre, who has a, a wonderful book from the 1980s called Whose Justice, Which Rationality, which, you know, points out that actually there are different traditions of reason and rationality based on the different assumptions that you have, the base assumptions, but that those base assumptions within these various traditions are just as contingent as each, as each other. We cannot claim that secularism's base assumptions, the sort of foundationalism on which Descartes, uh, Descartes uh, built his meditations, those sorts of um, presuppositions have been called into question within modern sort of like uh, philosophy. So no one's claiming uh, absolute knowledge, absolute objectivity and so on. So why is secularism being presented as, you know, the tradition of reason and, and religion is unreason? Actually, what's happening is secularism claims a specific regime of rationality, to use a kind of Foucauldian term. But religions have their own regimes of rationality, which make perfect sense in those sorts of context, contexts. They also have, you know, um, fantastically sophisticated ways of dealing with social problems, etc. In my estimation, as a, someone who's a student of the Islamic tradition, I know that. Okay, other traditions have kind of been depleted in the post sort of secular context of modern Europe, perhaps, but they can also be revived. But in my estimation, it's like laicite is a religion. Um, the, the British state's sort of liberalism is a religion. The, an example that I give is in the United States, you know, you have a religious, this is going to be provocative for a lot of people, but I, I'll just sort of maybe wrap up this component with this analogy. You have the uh, United States Constitution. It is a religious document in my estimation, in my conception of religious religion, which is based on deen. Why? Because it is a text which is read to be true. It's not that, okay, can we check whether this is authentic historically or not, etc. No, we read it as a document that we have to implement regardless. And we even have clerics um, who are trained for years and years to become masters of reading constitutional law. And we even have hierarchies of clerics. So the entire judicial system goes all the way to the Supreme Court, which is the mujtahideen mutlaqeen, so to speak. <laughs> you know, they're the absolute authorities. And, you know, they have the right of checking the legislative through judicial review, checking the executive through judicial review. So the ulama, the clerical classes, do have a check on the system. We accept that because it's called a secular system. And you've gotten rid of Christianity or Judaism or Islam. But why is that different from Christianity, Judaism or Islam in my estimation? I don't think there's a good uh, answer to that question. I happen to know that the Islamic tradition, its historic, historical preservation makes it for me far more compelling than the ideas that have been come up with yeah, but, by, you know, by certain many, figures. Many, w many would oppose that, you know, more according to quotation marks, pragmatism that yeah. Politics is always filthy and dirty and that there is no morals, whereas religion right. puts forward a set of uh, uh, 
higher uh, higher moral ground right. and that you cannot mix a set of principles based on morality in a field where you know anything is uh, possible and that the very notion that you expect morality in politics is yeah. something that you know coming out of straight of wonderland right i mean this is like just it's such a clutching at straws argument that uh, secularists will make in my estimation that oh you know religion is about pure ideals and politics is dirty a dirty business and those two shouldn't mix and it's like yeah we, we think politics is pure evil and we want people to flourish in that pure evil of politics no i mean like if if religion is uh, sort of like about pure human Id and pure ideals well humans are the authors of sin and the authors of you know corruptibility and all of those things so maybe uh, religion should be separated from human beings as well and to be honest that's what secularists are saying very often as well um ironically of course they you know the same people sometimes will say oh actually no um sort of uh, sec uh, religion it can create certain types of corruption and therefore we need to excise religion from society. I, well, I don't think you know, secular yeah. fundamentalists you know, are doing that today, saying that in right. the public space right. you have no right to express your religious identity or even right. use right. You know, a religious lexi you know, lexicon. Right, right, right. right. Me, yeah. But, uh, but as, you, um, as I kind of, uh, I, think, I don't think I said this on the recording, but as I was saying earlier, like there are plenty of social scientists who point out the kind of laicite that you have in France is actually a religion. Right. Like, so even according to their definition of dogmatism, because very often these social scientists will say religions are unusually dogmatic, they'll say laicite. And these are very often, you know, Anglophone sociologists, because in Anglophone culture, France just seems like a bizarre outlier in the tradition of liberalism, right? Um, with its uh, hard nosed sort of uh, laicite. Now, at the same time, what I'm arguing is actually even you thinking that you're living within this kind of like moderate secularism which is procedural and not um, programmatic some that's a distinction that they sometimes use um, are actually living in a um, in a religious uh, sort of ethos as well um, and uh, I but I'm saying I don't think that that's a problem per se I'm just saying why is it okay for you but it's not okay for me right for me to bring my religion into the public sphere. I actually think that there has to be, and I hope to contribute to this discourse at some point, Muslims need to think about what does it mean for me to be a, a Muslim minority in the West? How does my religion impact my public engagement in a democracy, in a democracy that is a non-Muslim majority democracy? And I think Muslims have a massive role to bring their own religious and ethical worldview uh, to call for justice uh, you know, in, in these states as well. Um, this is something which uh, you know I've always felt constrained to be able to articulate in this way because I was imprisoned by those conceptions of secularism as being you know distinct from religion but actually it's only distinct from religion in the secularist conception of religion but that's a highly eurocentric definition of religion that emerges in the last two three centuries I make that secularists want want to uh, uh, remove the very notion of religion from society that's, uh, the, so Many of them, that's, yeah, they will tell you that's our objective that's what we want but yeah. we are we are held we are constrained by the constitution and you know uh, yeah. and the rule of law but the but the useful thing about my my framing of secularism as a religion is when they're trying to remove religion from the public sphere, what they're actually engaged in is religious intolerance, right? So I mean, like what they claim to be uh, something which is a value of their own, they're actually uh, upholding a dogmatic religious tradition of their own. Okay, I actually think that Islam is not a dogmatic religious tradition in the way that laicite, for example, or certain types of secularists. Uh, the sort of secularism that is upheld by, for example, the British humanists in the UK, where someone like uh, Richard Dawkins, as like their honorary leader, w was uh, saying things like, oh, I don't need to sort of read the Quran to um, sort of know that Islam is a bad religion. Do I need to read Mein Kampf to know that Nazism is bad? Right. I mean, that sort of, you know, um, obtuse uh, and, you know, nakedly Islamophobic attitude is something which is only possible if you have created this mythical category of religion, which you are not, but everyone else is, right? But once they start to recognize, actually, you're a religion as well, um, you, you start, all of those myths will start to uh, dissipate. And of course, they will fight tooth and nail not to accept that sort of a conception. And I'm, I'm just telling them, look, I'm fine with you as your secular religion. I don't have a problem with that. It's just that you don't have a right to monopolize the public sphere. We all have a right to participate as we are as full human beings of our own religious traditions, whether it's secularism, whether it's Christianity, whether it's Islam, to participate in that public sphere.
we spoke, and this is what would be my, my last question, the floor will sure. be given to you. Um, from the Muslim world, we'd, we went on to speak of the West and its centered uh, conception of secularism and separation of religion and uh, uh, politics. Right. If we bring this debate more locally to, to Western Muslim communities, right. and the way that, as you spoke er, said earlier a few seconds ago that there is a need for a muslim presence in the uh, uh, public sphere to express right. what it means right. to seek you know what uh, uh, um, uh, an ideal society would look like in terms right. of uh, justice equality and, and the promotion of you know uh, vivre ensemble like you know living together right. as a nation composed of various uh, components right. how does that apply for muslim to, uh, to muslim communities when many have withdrawn from the public sphere for the reasons we know you know the right. you know right. repression or the repression of muslim visibility especially in the case of france right the fact that islamic organizations in the west especially in france and you know maybe less so in other countries have been enabled to articulate a muslim proposal for a just and, and peaceful society right and what it means for day-to-day -day muslims uh in dealing with their you know islamic uh you know authority while at the same time being able to say listen i'm as much a muslim as i am french as i am a descendant of moroccan algerian uh, you know uh, pakistani uh, 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 background etc how does that apply another question is quite complex but yes. how should muslims in the west deal with this notion that okay Islam, like other religions, has been used to justify outright brutality. Bush used uh, you know, Christianism to justify his war in Iraq. Nobody questioned the prevalence of Christianity on the, on the American government. The same thing with others in the West. Right. At the same time, we see th this absence as a handicap because as Muslims don't have a public say in public affairs, the government is stepping in and saying we are going to frame your religion according to our own preferences right. the same way they did in the colonies uh right. what's his name um leo, leo roche even got a, a personal fatwa from the uh, the sheriff in mecca saying right. as long as you pray and fast and go to mecca right. you don't have to, you, you should not fight you know france and you should not fight you know the colonial enterprise right Right. You know, please give us a conclusion uh, uh, yeah. uh, on that. You ask, you ask a question which I, you know, I, I think really deserves. Um, a whole podcast. I mean, I'd like to write a book on it, to be honest, because it, 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 it's, it's the big question of our time, right? Especially for those of us who are, you know, um, b born and raised in um, sort of Western countries as Muslim minorities, as as I put it, like persecuted Muslim minorities and Western plutocracies. In that sort of a context, like, what does it mean to be Muslim? And uh, I, I can only give like a, a, a snippet here, but you know I uh, spend a lot of time reading um, sort of people who are up in arms about climate justice, up in arms about sort of the um, the rights of the poor and the socially marginalised. Um, you know, I a scholar I have a great deal of admiration for is someone called Jason Hickel, who has written about. He wrote his first book was called The Divide, talking about the global north and south and how to this day. Uh, the global north sucks out resources systematically and systemically from the global south to the point that um, one of the sort of uh, shocking sort of statistics he has in his book is I think in the last sort of 70 years or so more wealth has been um, sort of like illicitly uh, uh, misappropriated by the global north from the global south than during colonialism for example so you know those sorts of things um but at the same time the same scholar his next book was about degrowth it's called less is more he's at the uh, london school of economics if i recall correctly now you know those sorts of causes are muslim causes as far as i'm concerned you know those of us who have the privilege to uh you know have a certain degree of financial independence perhaps um and are muslim living in the west i mean one of the things that i um uh, do think is relevant here is that Muslims also live in poverty, considerable poverty in, in this um, sort of part of the world. So uh, a study from Oxford University in the last decade said that 50% uh, of Muslim households in the UK live in poverty. Um, so in, in many respects, actually, our community struggle is an internal one about trying to, you know, raise their own condition, de dedicating themselves to be able, being able to bring in the financial resources. But 
you know, people who are in poverty very often don't have the luxury to reflect. They don't have the, the leisure time that's required to think about systemic change. But that's what we in so, in so many ways so desperately need. We need the we need people in our community to recognize, well, part of the reason you're in poverty is because of systemic problems that need to be addressed, that we as a community should be addressing as Muslims that, who are driven by a sense of justice that is called for uh, by the Quran itself, not just for other Muslims, but for society as a whole to be able to flourish. We are we are supposed to, you know, when, when God talks about supporting the um, people who are being tyrannized, he never specifies that it's only the Muslims who matter, right? It's people being tyrannized, whatever their sort of like ethnic, religious um, background, etc. And so in that sort of context, we need to uh, think about what does it mean to be Muslim? At the same time, there are certain compli uh, complications and complexities that we need to think about, um, you know, in in ways that sometimes um, those of us who are activists and on the left will think, OK, every sort of cause um, because the left is actually quite committed to uh, justice uh, in, in so many uh, respects. But not every single cause um, might be something that is entirely congruent with, um, you know, the the interests of the Muslim community. And we need to ideally have a situation where we can talk about some of these sorts of things um, and have frank conversations that look, you know, there's so much that we can gain from partnering but we do also have certain different values in certain areas. And I think that's a, a delicate balance which also requires a certain type of, you know, it doesn't have to be an all or nothing attitude in these sorts of questions. Um, and that's why I think um, we do need to sort of, sp I, I need to spend a lot more time and I need to write about these issues uh, t because writing helps me think through these issues as well. Um, but I hope that that is somewhat satisfying, uh, even if it's an incomplete answer, inshallah. Dr. Usama Al Azmi, thank you very much for this time spent with us, and of course for the wealth of information you have shared with us, taken from your book Islam and the Arab Revolutions: The Ulama's or Scholars Between Democracy and Autocracy, published at Hearst Publishers. As for you, dear listeners, this was Yasser Luwati coming to you from the Paris South Side Bonjour. If you feel like this podcast is worthy of your support, please do so on PayPal. Uh, contact at cjl.ong or directly on our website cjl.ong slash en whatever amount you may give us will of course help us maintain our autonomy and of course you can support us by sharing this podcast on your various platforms speak to you soon stay safe and the struggle continues <laughs>